And good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, whichever the case may be. On this rotating globe, welcome to another edition of The Other Side of Midnight, that magical time between dusk and dawn where, well, at least on this show, all kinds of things can happen and continue to happen and continue. Do you know we've had fires going on out here, major wildfires burning thousands of acres for over two months? And every time the wind shifts and the smog and the smoke and the toxic stuff kind of gets into this canyon, um, I'm kind of down for the count. So I want to apologize for last night. And uh, I have no idea when they're going to get this thing under control. But uh, it, it really is almost one of those Tennessee Ernie Ford lines where, you know, God willing and the creek don't rise. Well, in this case, it's God willing and the wind don't shift. So um, I think we're okay for tonight, but uh, until they get this, uh, until they get this fire situation under control, um, we're probably going to have some other interim outs here. So we'll try to steer among the Shriptus and the other guy and uh, uh, continue to do what we're trying to do, which is to shed illumination on some very, very murky things. I mean, tonight's topic, tonight's subject is something that, I've kind of been building toward for a while. Uh, I'm going to share with you some unusual data, which I have been quietly pursuing, separate from what my uh, guests are going to talk about. And we're going to kind of at the end of the next three hours, we're going to pool our resources and see if um, independently we've kind of all arrived at the same page. Until then, um, let me go through some news items because there's some really important stuff happening uh, around the world and in the rest of the United States. First of all, if you are new to the show, we have a section called Radio with Pictures where um, basically I stole that from RKO back when Robin and I had a development deal at RKO to do a film version of the discovery of the face on Mars, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe someday that will be resurrected. Anyway, so I kind of was involved with RKO, and I love their idea of uh, radio pictures. And then I thought, maybe if we just modify that. So rather than have unending streams of TV stuff of you and me looking at each other in cameras, I decided that radio required good audio, good visual description, because it is radio, But for those that like a picture, to want to see a reference or a website or a a documentation of something that has been said, a section where we can put those things and you can go either during the show or after the show, or when you're listening to the uh, Club 19.5 archive, that that would be a meaningful part of what we're trying to do here. So we created Radio with Pictures. If you go to the other side of midnight.com, click on tonight's banner which says very dramatically with a picture which is uh, really weird, has Earth been silently invaded? That's for tonight, which is Sunday, uh, January 5th, um, here in the Western Hemisphere. What you want to do is click on that banner. That will take you to the guest page. And right under the guest page banner, you'll see three names, Richard, John, and Georgia tonight. Click on my name. That takes you down to my news items. Item number one, we are getting ready as a society, as a culture, as a planet. We are getting ready to go back to the moon. And I can sit here with absolute certainty tonight and tell you that when that happens, everything is going to change. And what do I mean by that? I mean that the public perception of the moon is going to dramatically shift because even the first images from the Artemis unmanned mission, which is going to be launched into a, I think, um, uh, two-way, two-week, I'm sorry, two-week orbit around the moon in the next uh, uh, month or two, Uh, is going to usher in visually some stunning stuff. Now, I'm predicating this on the idea 
that we are light years past the capability of NASA to basically intervene and censor all the stunning live high death video we're going to be getting from the Artemis mission from the Orion spacecraft that will be orbiting the moon and looking at new sites, looking at the orbital mechanics for the gateway part of the Artemis program, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that some of this new video, this incredible high resolution video, as well as images, will make it into the internet and all around the world. That's the best case scenario. Because if that happens, life is going to change. Why? Because there's stuff there. Amazing, mind-blowing stuff built by somebody. And we have an idea based on all our research as to whom. But that's going to kind of unfold if these images go public. Now, let's assume worst, worst, worst case scenario. The NASA tries to do exactly what it did for decades around Apollo, around Lunar Orbiter, around, uh, you know, Lunar Prospector, around the, uh, the Lunar Reconso- Reconnaissance uh, Observer, that they're going to try to censor the data. That's where Elon Musk comes in. Because he, in the next couple of years, if not sooner, you can never really depend on Musk for a timeline because things change, he's going to be sending private citizens in a private spacecraft on a private rocket, the Starship. He's going to be sending eight average human beings. I don't mean that in terms of their skills or perception, but their background that will not be part of the military industrial complex. In fact, he's looking to have an artist, a billionaire from Japan, lead this party of eight or nine, or I forget what the number is, of uh, tourists who will basically spend many days, if not a couple weeks, orbiting the moon, taking as many selfies as possible and looking at it with all kinds of cameras and video and other sensors. And in other words, back to the idea of the founding fathers, which is competition. How do you get truth in a melange of a society? You have competing factions and forces and spokespeople and experiencers And the First Amendment allows them to tell their story. So, if NASA doesn't give us the truth, Elon Musk may, I say that with a caveat, and if Elon doesn't, there's a whole bunch of other private players coming up very fast on the inside track using racetrack metaphors mercilessly, which are going to be sending little teeny tiny CubeSat spacecraft to orbit the moon on, you know, piggybacked on other private missions. So the idea that anybody can control every real image of the stunning real stuff that will be visible on current state-of-the-art digital imaging cameras and other technology, it's not going to happen. At some point, the real stuff will leak through. And then, as my uh, grandmother used to say, it will be Katie bar the door. Now, this all kicks off tomorrow morning, literally uh, an hour from the end of, no, two hours from the end of our show, when NASA once again opens those huge payload bay doors in the vertical assembly building or the vehicle assembly building there in uh, Florida and slowly on this giant crawler like with the Saturn V decades ago they roll the Artemis uh, space launch system mission number one rocket this huge mega rocket and spacecraft to the pad over the next several hours uh, maybe six, eight hours. I forget how long the trip takes. They Their max speed is like, you know, two miles an hour down those big, broad, gravel-strewn highways they built to take the weight of the uh, of the rocket carrier, the, the crawler. Anyway, um, all that will culminate tomorrow, and then they will do what's called the countdown demonstration test where they fill the tanks with fuel, in this case, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, and um, 
they uh, count the count. They bring the countdown right down to T minus zero, and then they stop. And they drain everything, and they go back, and they look at all their data, and then they decide if everything is, is okay. And the last test was not. They had many issues to solve, so they had to roll it back into the, ver the vehicle assembly building. Um, they will tell us at the end of this test, probably in maybe a week or two, when they're going to schedule the actual launch. And that launch, even though it's unmanned, not only carries tons of cameras, but it also will carry several CubeSats into lunar orbit, some of which also have cameras. So what are we going to see? That's not, you know, a rhetorical question. It's a real question because we know it's there based on decades of research that we have done. We know what could be photographed if, you know, the game wasn't rigged. The question now is going to be, is the game going to be green? Will they hold out to the last, you know, starving NASA technician before they show us what the moon really is and how it can incredibly, positively change the destiny of humans here on Earth? That kind of is the backdrop to our conversation this morning, so uh, things could get quite interesting. Let me ask a couple of very dumb questions on the air, given that we've been having some uh, technical difficulties behind the scenes. Do we have uh, Dr. Solheim with us yet? I don't think we do. Okay. Do we have John Womack with us? Because he is... Uh, uh, going to be one of our guests. I, I think we, we do have Ron Gerbron. Ron, if you can make a little noise, let us know you're there. Are you there? Mr. Gerbron. Mute. There you are. Uh, um, yeah, muting. So, super. Muting. Okay. Hey, okay. Hey. And there's Jonathan. Jonathan, welcome to the other side of midnight. I will get to detailed backgrounds on everybody when it's appropriate, but resuming the news, just so I know you're all kind of waiting there in the wings, uh, item number two, as you know, for the last um, several months since last Christmas, we've been posting web updates. Well, they're now into the detailed testing of the uh, one of the instruments called the Near Infrared uh, Imaging Slicing Spectrometer. And the detail, the background of what that gadget does and how important it is to the overall web mission is there in item number two. Item number three is where web is. That's kind of a perennial. We keep it up there so you can kind of monitor progress. Number four. Now, this is a really interesting backdrop to tonight's conversation. Remember, I've been saying for many, many years that what's going to have to happen because of the hyperdimensional physics model is there has to be basically an overall astronomical revolution, not only in astrophysics, which is what makes stars shine, how they form, how planets form, how planets function, et cetera, et cetera, but everything up to and including how galaxies form, how they're fleeing from us from an imaginary center where we're supposed to be at uh, up to the speed of light because of the uh, redshift measurements and the so-called uh, Big Bang model of the expansion of the universe. All of that, I have been saying for a long, long time, is going to be called into fundamental question when astronomers and astrophysicists and the money that funds them, which most of it now comes from the government, changes from keep the real stuff secret to, okay, it's time to let the real stuff hang out. So item number three, this is a very important article. Read it carefully. It's called The Sun is Stranger Than Astrophysicists Imagined. And what they're doing is laying out all the ways the sun does not conform to the current physics model of how the universe is supposed to work, the so-called standard model, including specific details in a universe where things are always supposed to flow from hot to cold, high energy to low energy. Well, around the sun and around every star that we've now looked at with any kind of decent instrumentation, there is this super hot corona. So if the, if the sun surface is about 10,000 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, the corona above it, just by thousands of miles, 
is measured at more than 2 million degrees. How in the world does the sun communicate at a low temperature, a super hot temperature, relatively speaking, to the corona just above it, and what maintains this flow in absolute apparent contradiction to the four known laws of thermodynamics? Well, there are more clues. In fact, as you read that piece, at the very end, the writer, I believe he's a physicist, is talking about, do we need to introduce exotic physics to explain the new data that we're seeing? And the answer, guys, is yes! (laughs) Anyway, that is the backdrop to tonight's conversation, because I'm going to be talking about things that are normally in the realm of the occult, the paranormal, the things that go bump in the night, the woo-woo factor, all those pejorative terms. And I'm going to be talking about those effects, those phenomenologies, those events, not in the context of occult or religious perspectives, but in the perspective of a hyper dimensional physics that makes all those apparent weirdnesses, anomalies, miracles actually possible. In fact, it mandates that they occur or they be able to occur, including consciousness moving between dimensions to reach into our 3D nursery and somehow in some cases, do something in such a way that the effects here are demonstrably catastrophic. In other words, are we dealing in a multidimensional universe where both benign, positive, and negative entities, negative consciousness, can come through, can come across, can transit between these dimensions to influence either for good or for ill what's happening on planet earth and in the largest rubric of our evening's conversation have in fact we been invaded not by some kind of shoot 'em up Star Wars scenario of colonial battle fleets and, you know, uh, Orson Welles and Martians coming and giant stilted robot legs, but have we in fact been quietly, silently, secretly invaded by what was termed by Walter Pigeon's character in Forbidden Planet, a very important movie which we'll go through. Uh, point by point someday, I I promise, are we in fact experiencing here and now on planet Earth what was termed by Pigeon's character, Dr. Morbius, as monsters from the id, except they're not from our id. Hold that thought. Item number five. You, we've been following, and one of the trigger points for this conversation Um, was the extraordinary, incredible horror of what happened in Uvalde just two weeks ago. Since Uvalde, we have now lost, I have lost track personally of how many mass shootings we have had, defined officially as four people, not counting the shooter, or more killed. Just last week, we had a stunning example happen in uh, Tulsa, and I'll get to that in a minute. Before that, however, if you look at item number five, one of the things which has been really becoming more and more bothersome is the fact that in complete accord with Murphy's Law, everything that could have gone wrong with rescuing those kids in Uvalde went wrong. And item number five is a, a mainstream story on everything the police claimed about Uvalde that has now been debunked, up to and including item number six. I mean, item number six, which is stunning 
first ran on the CBS News the other night, my old alma mater. I then found out, and it was too late for me to get uh, Keith to post it, so maybe during the show he can post it as a new number seven and we move everything else down. There is a um, Washington Examiner story which covers the same incident with the same people and is talking with them from a separate uh, in- set of interviews. So we now have more than one source. Um, it turns out that there was the woman. Remember the woman outside who was arrested by the police when, as every mother should, she attempted to rush into the school and rescue her children, and they literally flung her to the ground, handcuffed her, and it was only because um, someone in the town knew her really well that, and she promised to be a good girl that they let her up and took off the handcuffs and ultimately did not arrest her. But then she ran around the back, jumped the fence, went in the school, rescued her two kids and reported. And this is really very, very important. Remember how we've been hearing the 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 kind of litany for the last two weeks that initially seven of the local police entered the school and then when they were fired at they backed off because two of them were slightly wounded through the walls through the door with the uh, shooters ak uh, i'm sorry ar-15 and then later that there were 19 of these officers standing around waiting for the technical commander to give the go-ahead to break down the door get rid of the shooter and rescue the kids. Well, we now know from this woman who was in the school, who physically in there rescued her children at the height of the crisis when there were supposedly 19 cops milling around in that hallway, which we've heard about over, over, over again. It turns out from her first person testimony There were no cops in the school at all. Let me say that again. According to this mother's first-hand report, no cops in the school at all. While the town, the town council, the police department, other authorities, the district attorney, everybody is claiming officially there were 19 cops standing twirling their thumbs in that hallway as those kids were being massacred. What's wrong with this picture? Item number seven. As you're going to hear, the model that I'm working on, which I'm hoping will correlate with my other guest tonight, is that there's some incredibly dark, malign, and I'll put it, I'll hit it on the head, evil influence which is controlling certain events on Earth tonight, right now. And the problem, of course, is to be able to look at this or look at that and say, okay, that's because of that, and that's not because of that. The art form, of course, is always discerning the details. Now, let's look at Ukraine. Look at item number seven. Out of the blue, out of nowhere except in his own head, we see... The head of Russia, the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, starting a war which is massacring tens of thousands of people with long-range artillery daily, hourly now. And we see him literally in item number seven targeting and smashing one of uh, Ukraine's most venerable uh, Roman Orthodox churches. There it is in flames. Is this war in Ukraine, which not only is killing tens of thousands of children, men, women, soldiers, whatever, in Ukraine, all unprovoked, is this in fact only a trigger for a much larger catastrophe impending on the horizon if this goes on too long? Because by bottling up through the Black Sea, Uh, Ukraine's exports of grain. I mean, Ukraine is one of the world's biggest grain exporters. There are people in Africa, in the Middle East, in other parts of the world who are literally going to starve to death because Ukrainian grain is not available because the Russians have said, as of today, formally, they will not allow 
any Ukraine grain exports up to and including into Russia, which, of course, was a major consumer of Ukraine grain, both before, during and after the Soviet Union's, you know, existence and then the rise of the independent nation Ukraine. Um, Is this, again, not a byproduct, not accidental, but part of the long range plan to with this as a catalyst, this war, to ultimately wind up killing millions of people all over the world? And is this part of something so extraordinarily dark, so bizarre, so out of keeping with anything we can imagine that you'd basically say this is an evil plot to create an extraordinary mega person sacrifice at this particular time? And when I talk about time, we'll get into that probably toward the end of the program, because if that's what's going on, the timing with what's going on celestially, which going on hyperdimensionally, which going on cosmically in terms of cycles and when things can happen and port between dimensions and when it's much more. In other words, is all of this part of a grand tapestry of opportunity because you only get this chance to do this horrible set of deeds once roughly every 25,000 years, give or take, when you imprint the entire next cycle. That's part of the hypothesis. Now, as soon as you think nothing can get more bizarre or more evil, let me direct you at item number eight. Item number eight, I just happened to uh, to run across this this afternoon. There is a doctor, apparently a real doctor, his name is Dr. Kerr, who wants to end all school shootings by doing what he says is the obvious thing. He wants to arm the students. I mean, think about that. He wants to arm the students. How in the world does that make any sense at all, unless you're design, you're designing a system which basically is going to throw everything into total chaos. Because can you imagine being a fourth grader with a Smith and Wesson handgun? I, I mean, it just just the mind boggles that rational people are coming forth with such in absurdities and stupidities and, and you know I'm a wordsmith and I, I've kind of run out of words so on that note um, I want to play a little thing here from the Ukrainian National Anthem we will take a small break and we shall return with our guests because we have a very weighty topic this morning are all these increasing bizarrenesses and outright demonstrations of evil are they in fact not part of humans at all, but something which has been specifically imposed, and if so, how can we change it? You're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland. We shall return. I mean, think about it. We've been living on this planet, we're told, for millions of years. I know from the anthropological record, and I'm sure uh, Ron is going to join uh, in in that conversation uh, shortly. I know that there is absolute incontrovertible proof that our ancestors, so-called Neanderthals and Homo sapiens sapiens, live together their their tenure on earth overlapped for a significant period of time and the thing that i remember back you know some couple of decades ago when this data was was uh, proven was that they the anthropologists could find no evidence of any 
systematic warfare between these two very dissimilar ancestors of us. None. So when was warfare, when was possession, when was uh, imperialism, when was colonialism, when were all these, you know, slavery, when were all these, quote, ancient human traits manifest in the archaeological record? Well, actually, they don't seem to go much farther back than maybe six or seven thousand years ago. And is that trying to tell us something? Is that trying to say that maybe this is not these traits, these aberrations, these these tendencies, these overwhelming, you know, faults of being human, that they're not? Are we in fact under the influence and have not been for a very long time of something else? That's the question tonight. Has something surreptitiously, secretly, malevolently tried to, in essence, kill us in the crib before, before what? That's going to be part of our discussion, too. So let me go to um, uh, the proper page here and begin to introduce my cast of characters for this evening. We've got Ron. Of course, Ron Gerbron is our resident generalist. Uh, as you know, he was raised on a farm in Pennsylvania and um, found out a lot about programmings of education, particularly higher education, after attending a famous Quaker school in Pennsylvania. He um, tried to contort himself into attending real serious mainstream college, but gave up on academia and left for travel overseas and real world experience. And through all the time, though, he's focused his core attention on our own paleo history, particularly the fact that our history now appears to be um, occupying more than just this one planet. So Ron is present, Ron Gerbron. We also have Jonathan Womack. Now, John's personal story is really interesting. And it, it's all there on the website, so you can read it. But primarily, John has been an out-of-body experiencer, kind of traveling the hyperdimensional realms between galaxies and dimensions for uh, most of his life. And he has some very interesting, if <clears throat> controversial, uh, experiences that he can relate, as well as is well acquainted with the literature and now currently is um, a man of many talents. He's an, um, creates amazing websites. He's working on one for our research right at the moment. Um, he also is, uh, uh, he, he used to work at Harvard as one of the IT people. Um, he, uh, let's see, what else? Oh, John is another generalist. And polls, that are kind of halfway between 3 and 4D, um, with the uh, current one being uh, uh, titled The Dolphinius Effect. That's in the Ram I Am series. And we're going to be joined in uh, about an hour by uh, um, uh, Georgia Lambert. And somewhere along the way, I'm hoping we can pick up um, Bruce Solheim, who was supposed to be here this evening, but apparently because he was going to give us some other extraterrestrial perspectives. Somebody doesn't want him part of the show. Anyway, um, we'll sort all this out in the next uh, hour and a half, two hours, three hours, whatever. So without further ado, welcome everyone, everyone who's here, to the other side of midnight. Hi, Richard. Hi there, Ron. John, you yeah. there? Yeah, I'm here. Super. And we don't yet have Bruce. Okay. Um, guys, I want you to take a, a offense at the most outrageous thing I said. And given that John is the experiencer and Ron is the critic, <clears throat> let's have John go first. Yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, I'd like to share a personal anecdote involving Ukraine. Ah. Um, 
seven years ago. I'm shopping on audiojungle.net where I purchase most of my music for my editing. I downloaded a song I really liked. I spend hours and hours and hours listening. So I download this preview of a song. I don't know where I'm going to use it. I know I'm going to use it someday. So seven years pass. A couple of weeks ago, I'm cutting the trailer for uh, me and Maria Wheatley's project, The Secret History of Stonehenge. Mm. And I have a few thousand songs in my archives. I'm, I'm listening, listening. I finally get toward the end, I, and I hear this song from seven years ago. I, that's the song. <laughs> and so, so I import it into Premiere Pro. I'm very focused. I'm working and cutting the trailer, and I get a ping from my spirit guide. Stop what you're doing. Find this guy. Tell him this story, what just happened. So I go to look for this guy's uh, name on Audio Jungle, and it's he's no longer there. Oh, my gosh. And, and the song, uh, the title is just like, uh, you know, ambient flow or, you know, just some ambiguous title. And so I'm looking. I... I find the guy's name. It's uh, kind of a Russian-sounding name, and now I'm looking for him on the web. And he's got to have a. There's no website. And I go, oh, this looks like him on Facebook. So I go on Facebook and look at his profile. Sure enough, this is the guy. I found him. So I, I started typing to him. I said, "Hi, my name is John." And I said, "I really like this song." And I downloaded it seven years ago, not knowing when I need it, but I'm going to use it for this Stonehenge trailer. And I just want you to know how much I enjoy all your other work, too. I just, I really love your work. It's beautiful, great co compositions. And it turns out, so he writes back to me. It was very emotional because he's in Ukraine. He's Ukrainian. Oh, and, my. Uh, oh, oh. So he was overwhelmed and uh, just very appreciative that I sent him this ray of hope. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're all connected, and I think part of the, the, the one of the, and I, I hate this idea of reasons because I'm not really in the mode of thinking things happen for reasons, but the idea that, you know, in the midst of this incredible catastrophe, this one person reaches through the new sphere, lodges in your brain, connects at the right time to our incredible ancient past, which has been suppressed, as we're going to talk about this evening at some length, I'm sure. And, and suddenly this guy has the right piece at the right time and the right place to make the closure of, the, of, of, of what you're trying to create. I mean, that, that, that's pretty impressive. And it's for the Stonehenge project, and we've been working at Stonehenge with Maria on the ET communication project. So there's a lot of things that kind of came together there for me. Okay. Ron, did I say anything that violated any of your sensibilities tonight? Because if I haven't, I'll just have to try harder, I guess. Mr. Gerbron. Whoops! I unmuted. Yes, no, um, not so far. I'm I'm waiting. They'll happen. Uh, I would like to say, I would like to say something on the ancestral track about the Neanderthals and the um, uh, so-called anatomically modern humans. Mm -hmm. I mock that term because this is as ridiculous as UAPs. They decide the uh, establishment of uh, the ologies decided that they didn't like the term Cro-Magnon. Right. Which literally, which literally is a very archaic root uh, form from French that means caveman. Right. Okay, that seems to work. But yeah, no, they didn't like that because uh, genetically they don't match. They look just like us in every measurable res uh, respect, but a lot of the numbers are different. You know, if you go down to measuring things and calibrating things and uh, analyzing things. And so they said, okay, well, we need something that's more generic than that. And so they came up with uh, AMH or anatomically modern human. Anyway, yes, you're right. They apparently 
the two groups apparently got along pretty well. Yes. But that's because in my model, they were in separate camps anyway, and they didn't hang out with each other much. But it doesn't. Yeah, uh, but you can't. The important you, thing you, was. You, oh, hang on, hang on. You don't know that. From every well, you from every sentient behavior we know, when you have groups, they mingle. They don't stay apart. They don't stay in separate camps. They mingle. Now, do they mingle peacefully, or do they mingle in a in a more warrior fashion? But they mingle. So the idea you have these two genetically separate species on the planet, right next to each other in Europe, and they didn't have organized conflict, and we who are basically the same regardless of who we are, wherever we are on Earth, we are involved in and have been for 6,000 years in methodically developing better ways to kill each other. What's wrong with this ah, picture? Well, let me let me practice my sinister laugh. <laughs> you fell into my trap. The, uh, <laughs> uh, the reason that they didn't mingle is the same reason that if you um, are breeding pedigreed dogs, uh, you don't let your dogs go out and mingle with the other dogs in the neighborhood. See, you don't know any of that. Uh, That's total supposition. Uh, the, it, there's no language. Well, there's so no record. There's no nothing. You can't you extrapolate okay. our behavior Wait. to other two species that are not intimately related. If they mingled... No, no, no. In the sense, that, in the social sense, that you're we know they mingled. You know how we know? There. Well, did you ever see Close Encounters? Uh, not all the way through. I've only seen pieces of it, but that's not the point. You, you never. Hang on. Let me finish my point, and then you can come back yeah. and tell, tell me I'm wrong. At the end Garrett of Close, okay. at the at the end of of Close Encounters, there's a close up. Somehow Spielberg found a Neanderthal. Walking, remember how they they used to say you put a Neanderthal on the subway and dressed him in you know a business suit, nobody would notice. Well, nobody noticed mm-hmm. until they did a close up, and the damn guy was a Neanderthal, meaning genetically they weren't a a an inviolable barrier because you can't have children with genetically people that you can't have children with, but they were far enough apart that they looked dramatically different, but they still had kids together, but they didn't make war like everybody on earth now that we have kids with we also kill them i mean something's wrong with this picture and my model is something recently has intruded designed to keep us at a minimum down on the farm on earth isolated uh, i'm will i'm willing to accept that as a um, factor but uh to me it's pretty clear and you keep saying, "Well, there's no evidence. There's no evidence." Well, there are a few places where you, uh, where there have, there were at some point in the time, catastrophes, cave-ins, uh, the, who knows what, and you find bunches of bones. Right. And uh, the only time that we find uh, Neanderthal and modern human stuff mingled together, even though the mainstream is now admitting that they coexisted for practically 400,000 years. Uh, the, uh, it's, they are hybrids, you know, because the one thing that they could do was interbreed perfectly. Now, this is peculiar because there are certain things that, going back to the dog breeding, if you wish, but there are certain things that are a little uh, peculiar about the mixture because the shape of the head of the Neanderthals is completely different from the shape of the skull in the modern human. Absolutely. The brain is a different shape. Well, it's even, a, yet, it, hang on, hang on. Neanderthal even had bigger brains than cro About right. 1600 well, CC I compared mean, to 1400, I believe. Yes, uh, yeah. It, um, the important part is that genetically they were compatible. Now, the other players on that uh, party circuit <laughs> were as they're currently called the Denisovans and I, I'm happy to report that apparently the most widely used mainstream pronunciation of that is Denisovan okay. which to me seemed correct not Denisovan but in any case those <laughs> guys that they didn't be, you never even heard about who was found uh, by a Russian guy I think named Denis I think no 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 the bones were found in a cave that was the refuge of a hermit 
named Denise, who was an uh, uh, who had removed himself from the Russian oh, okay. Orthodox Church and was living down by the river, and it became known as uh, Denise's Cave, or uh, Denise. So it's Denise still the, attached to this one guy, right? Yeah, that's just okay. where the name came from. Yeah, that's, that's what, what I'm happened. saying. That yeah, was the yeah. location. It, yeah, it wasn't. There's no, you know, genetic information in that. I didn't but think the, so. Uh, those guys. No, those guys looked, as far as we can tell from the few bone, few bones that we have, uh, looked pretty much like us. More so than the. Um, wait, the wait, 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 wait! I didn't. Although I didn't. They didn't. I, I, I thought we had some teeth, maybe a couple of leg bones or whatever, but no cranial. Uh, fossils from Denisovans. Right. There's a there's a piece. Of, yeah. There's one piece of a skull, but there's not a lot of that. It's uh, yeah. We need more, but the evidence is that they were um, more like us than the Neanderthals. But we got along. Everybody got along just fine, as far as we can tell. Hmm. But there are ver- there are very few traces of any sort of interbreeding between the Denisovans and the modern human strain. Now they do, they did, they were able to mate with the Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. So what you're looking at is a long-term breeding project with three different gene pools. And actually there's best count so far about five. There's a couple we haven't named yet, but we know that there's a couple of other strains mixed in there just from okay, the you, stuff you, you just said the magic. You just said the know. magic phrase, and the duck just came down, and you're going to get, you know, five hundred dollars. <clears throat> Gosh, I wish. Quack. What? <laughs> you just mentioned three separate species of a breeding program. By whom? Yeah, exactly. Uh, someone other than us, obviously. Oh. The, uh, Your evidence no, for this? And, uh, well, some of the evidence is that all of those groups, and I wish that we could uh, that we had more Denisovan evidence. And I think it's sitting in wooden boxes in the back rooms of museums all around the world, because that's where most of the Neanderthal stuff came from. Mm-hmm. The uh, was it was it wasn't cataloged until later. In fact, it shouldn't even be called. Neanderthal, because you name stuff, there are conventions for this, you name stuff after the place that it's originally found, and it turns out that the there were some uh, Neanderthal remains found in the caves at the bottom of Gibraltar uh, 50 years before. Right. And it was right at the beginning of the 19th century. It was the 1950s, when the, or the 1850s, when they... Um, uh, uh, Found that they accidentally found the um, bones, which started with a skull cap, by the way. Funny you mentioned skulls. The first Neanderthal thing that was found was somebody recognized it as the top of a skull. Uh, and uh, they said, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, the reason they said, whoa, wait a minute, was that it was a quarrying company that was uh, blowing up a cliff, which was mostly good limestone, right. in order to turn it into cement and stuff and they but even in the uh, 1850s if you found human bones uh, you, you had to stop you had to go tell somebody you couldn't just say push it to the side and say no, no, no let's keep blowing stuff up so that's where they found, and it happened to be a skull but we have lots of Neanderthal stuff which means there's a total of maybe 500 skeletons from all over the okay, so let's let's. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. I want to move things kind of down the river here. Um, let's assume mm-hmm. this is some kind of ET breeding program for consciousness, intelligent life on Earth. You've got three competing, maybe five, if I understood you correctly, and then they all go away except one, us, right? Well, they all kind of merge. Everybody out there knows someone well that is uh that has a good percentage of neanderthal dna i'll give you an easy the forehead's an easy cheap shot if somebody has a forehead the size of david boreanis uh the um <laughs> actor the uh their laura that's neanderthal gene um genes but it still doesn't explain how those were able to mingle so effectively but 
teeth. Is, you mentioned it, teeth. Yeah. The, the Neanderthal's teeth are like three times the size of what we think of as normal teeth. So if you have a friend who has lovely teeth, but they're really, really big teeth. Okay, so we're talking just, uh, all right, so, all right, again, details. So, all mingle. So, some, all some people in. out there freak out when we get into too many details. I don't know why, because details are how you separate yeah. fact from fiction. But anyway, so we've got three species, maybe That's five, right. and, they, and they blend together either just because they really love each other or because someone wants them to, and we wind up with one, okay? What I'm intrigued with... Oh, it's with, very much the second part. Yeah, they were kept separate for most of the time. That's an important but detail. But you don't know that. How can you know yes, that? Yes, you do. How? How? Because you, be, because when you, find, when you find a Neanderthal place, uh, it's all Neanderthals in there unless they happen to have somebody but you haven't found the rec center you haven't in other words the number of fossils we have compared to the earth would fit on almost like a tennis you know table table tennis table i told you the one there's the most over neanderthal and there's five to six hundred uh skeletons yeah but the point is that that Uh, does not a statistical sample worth any meaningful assignment at all make to say they were kept apart we have no idea we know they were coexisting you know, it only well, takes coexisting in, in separated groups. I you mean, don't no know that. Sheep either. You, Ron, please don't go beyond the data. We don't well, how know did that. They end up there. Then how did they end up in separate valleys? A, because they areas. like to hang out in those valleys. Somebody may like the view over here as opposed to over there. In yeah. other words, you're, you can't yeah, make well, hard and fast rules. My point is this. We started out many. Not. We started out many. We're now one. We started out many. Mm-hmm very different and yet we did not systematically try to kill each other until we became one just day before yesterday six thousand years and suddenly we're all at each other's throats 24 7 we're, we got 400 million guns in this country alone we have a runaway freight train that nobody knows how to control all because suddenly enmity between us i believe mm-hmm. was introduced So are we dealing with two different, here's where I'm going, two different ET programs, one to develop consciousness on Earth and the other to kill it or at least make it a slave? Yes. Well, I think that's... Hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm very much a... I'm I'm, I'm hearing... Is that John? I I heard another (laughs) I was agreeing with you, Richard. Okay, uh, let's let John answer Uh, because we've laid out some really good foundation here. John? Yeah, there's a popular researcher from England. His name's Michael Hallowell, and he studies and researches jinn and history throughout the various, uh, the Bible and all these kind of uh, writings. And here's a quote from him, and I believe this relates to what you said in your intro, Richard, about the 26,000 year cycle. Mm -hmm. And he says, The jinn are coming through portals now in ones and twos to harass human beings, but the time will come when they will pour through in the thousands and we're all going to have a big problem. And I think we have my item number 11 is a a picture of the Hadron Collider and a lot of people think that is opening a massive portal to allow these beings to come into our reality and have a negative impact on us. See, and I would say, I I would say that instrumentality is kind of irrelevant because we're dealing with a hyperdimensional physics that doesn't require technology. It's consciousness, but it has to be a pretty high level consciousness. It's got to have a conduit. The bandwidth between dimensions have to match. Otherwise, you can't go through the gate. It's all frequency based and I don't think I think the Hadron thing is again another distraction. So no one takes this really seriously. Anyway, that's what makes horse races that's possible. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I. I well, I will say I, something I can agree with. Um, what John just brought up the uh, what I was what I was about to lead to was that you have to consider oral records. You have to consider folklore and myths and scriptures and uh, <clears throat> Zechariah Sitchin translations, all that stuff, that is valid data when you're talking about the social stuff. 
the stuff about the interbreeding goes back a little further. But someone who could speak expertly, which wouldn't be me, on the uh, uh, Anastasi, um, the uh, you know the Hopi Zuni, that uh, the North American um, Aboriginal stuff, uh, they had a real problem with cannibals. Those were the uh, they had a big battle between another species or or race, if you will, that were cannibalistic. And wait, how do we and know this? Although, how do we know this? Well, because they said that. Because they said. Oh, so, so this is oral tradition. Bones. This is oral tradition from these tribes, right? Yeah, backed up by things like they have found dig sites where the bones were gnawed upon. Okay, but my next question ate, is: ate the person. My next question is: How old are those yeah. folk histories compared to archaeology or anthropology? In other That's words, always tricky when it gets to North America. Yeah, they're, no, I'm right they're, there with you. They're, they're, they're relatively recent, meaning they could be talking about stuff within the window of the last 6,000 years. See what I mean? Yeah. Well, you could go, yeah, any, I, I, I'm, I'm easy there. I just say anything post the last ice age because the, <laughs> uh, the Indians, well, American Indians, I'm sorry, it's a more comfortable term. Uh, are uh, they have a different sense of time? Okay, than, hold it uh, there. The, West, the normal Western thing. We are at the top of the hour. My guest this morning so far: some are missing, some are here. We've got uh, Ron Gerbrun, our resident generalist. We have John Womack, our resident out of body and extraterrestrial explorer, is here. George is going to join us in about an hour. Bruce Solheim is missing. Not quite sure why. Um, maybe somebody didn't want us to talk to him tonight. Because he was going to talk to us about a study group, a current UFO slash UAP study group, which is involved in looking at exactly this potential. Gosh, and he's missing. You're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard Z. Hoagland. Tonight we're trying to grapple with the most amazing idea. Have we been invaded and some of us taken over? We shall return. And welcome back, everyone, on this Sunday night, June 5th, 2022. Good grief. The year is almost half over. We're coming up on the solstice. By the way, we're going to keep you informed on some things we're doing in relation to ancient sites, which is connected, obviously, to tonight's conversation, uh, and rituals, and invoking doorways, and who comes through, and who you don't want to come through. Anyway, John, please continue, because um, uh, this, this testimony of people who are kind of thinking like this is very important. And the idea that he was forecasting not a you know technology or an instrumentality, but just in terms of a phase of time when the trickle would become a flood. Yes, because throughout history, you've read about these jinn that um, the focus of my uh, items that's what, is the jinn, and uh, I wrote about them in my last novel, Ram I Am, because a certain scientist gets his hands on the Ring of Solomon, mm. and this was reportedly, <clears throat> it contained six jinn, and Solomon used this ring to control the jinn, and indeed he used them to help him build his temple. And it's reported in the Bible that 
they could lift, the jinn could lift 100 ton blocks of granite. And that's how Solomon was able to build this amazing temple. So, you know, back in the day, Earth wasn't that popu populated as compared to now. So I think that's part of the reason why we have more of them pouring in now than years ago. Um, my item number one is uh, a drawing of Solomon and the Jinn, and uh, item number two is Asmodeus. He was the leader of these six Jinn, very old, ancient, dark entity Jinn. The Jinns have all these crazy powers where they can, some of them mate with humans, they come into our reality, they influence people like the. You know, when I heard the Uvalde shooter's mom say, he, he loved his grandma, and I thought, that's very gin-like to me, where they can make people do things against their will. And I think the gin have, they, they find humans who will work with them, who are willing to sell their soul to the devil, so to speak, and the gin will put them in positions of power, and oh boy, it's it's it's. Well, how do scary. they do that if they're not already in control? Well, see, this is true. hang on, hang on, John, because I've really been focusing yeah. on this, Ron. No, it's a crucial, crucial question. Yeah. My my the preliminary data I have is there has to be some kind of trauma, really gut wrenching trauma, in an early human's life that sets them up as a kind of a victimology resonant person to then fall into resonance with this kind of influence. And that's as far as I've gotten. John, what do you think? Hmm, hmm. That, that makes sense, yeah. Um, well, Ron, you say, I, I'm not sure what your, your question was, but there are more... No, he, ba he basically asked, the Ron, you want to restate it then? Yeah, I just said, uh, you were saying the uh, people will sell their souls to the devil, so to speak, uh, yeah. in that context, and uh, they will thereby be rewarded by being set up in such and such a position. And I said, well, don't they already have to be in control to be able to do that? See, there are parts of this that... that strain credulity a little bit and I have no problem with the idea of people being psychically overwhelmed or controlled from outside and stuff but specific, to get too specific with the stories what's the difference between the jinn and other demons mm. uh, and where in the bible does it actually talk about lifting would you say thousand ton blocks of granite or hundred ton blocks of granite yeah hundred ton but where where I don't rec I don't recognize the reference do you know? I, mean, uh, there... I would Google it. Yeah, you can Google it and read all. There's quite a bit of information on online. Uh, but yeah. yeah, they find these humans are willing to. I'm not saying the humans are are, are poor and then they're suddenly rich. Uh, they're already, I think these humans are already in positions of power. And they have, they're not the most spiritually mature humans, let's put it that way. So that when the, the jinn says, hey, I... I got a deal for you, buddy, and and okay, let's do it. So they insert these. What's in it for in... the gin? Ah, well, because I'm not trying to be antagonistic here. Chaos. I'm just being Clinton. The, the Why? Gin, they want to create chaos. They feed off fear and chaos. And See, you know, I, okay. I, 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 let, let me stop you there. I've been hearing this for decades. You know, they feed off fear. I've yeah. been trying to figure out how does that feed anything. Because to me, when you consider the idea of feeding, it's like energy in, energy out. To me, it's more like a predilection. They like the taste of fear. It's like if you have your you know, choice between strawberry ice cream and something begins with S, most people will choose strawberry ice cream. So is it a predilection for simply gratification of a sense as opposed to a need, which makes it even worse. Yeah, I, I would say that's a fairly accurate statement. And in my book, Ram, I am actually, there's a scene where 
they're uh, the jinn are going off to do this bad thing and then they smell food coming from a kitchen and they one of the uh, lustful things they have is for food when they're in human form. The jinn have taken over the body, some human bodies. Well, in, wait, 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 wait. That story. sounds like in their original form, whatever that means, yeah. they cannot experience mm -hmm. sensations, but if they're in a three-dimensional construct, a, a body, a human, whatever, they suddenly can feel all and taste and express all five senses so it's basically a sen it's basically a high they're looking for a high that's right that's fair yeah i yeah. well there are tons of references to the um to that equation i guess you could call it that uh i mean in celtic myth uh if you go to the if you travel to um Tirnanag or the land of fairy do not eat the food, because if you eat the food, you will be stuck there. Oh, that's a good signpost up ahead. <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, they, uh, yeah, and they're that's you know this is woven all woven through a lot of a lot of those myths, and it 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 shows up elsewhere as well. I mean, there's the whole vampire thing. Vampires are after nutrition. Vampires do not automatically kill their victims. They prefer them to. Continue producing I was going to say, so you know, if, if you keep more tomorrow, yeah. if you keep killing your flock, you don't get eggs. So, yeah, okay, exactly, yeah, and that's what makes things like the the outrageous examples, like that uh, story from the Southwest about the, uh, which is archaeologically apparently validated, uh, about the redheaded giants. That's how they're usually described. Mm -hmm. uh, that were cannibals that the uh, ancestors of the Hopi had so many problems with. Uh, they finally managed to kill them off, but it, was, it wasn't easy. And it wasn't a bunch of Vikings, because the Vikings have no great, uh, even though they were there pre-Columbus, they, <laughs> they, they, they well, have no great Well, do you remember a book by, by, by uh, I think it was David Thompson and uh, Michael Cremo? Was it David Thompson? Uh, anyway. But wouldn't it be Peter Thompson? No, 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 no. That's, that's someone else totally. No, uh, uh, Cremo okay. had another author who I think was a mathematician. Anyway, they did this huge book. Mm -hmm. I called it the 25-pound doorstop because it was basically the hidden history of archaeology. And all they'd done is go back, you know, a couple of hundred years and scour the newspapers like Charles Fort and put all the mm -hmm. bizarre archaeological finds that have disappeared in one book. I called it the 25-pound doorstop because it was big. Mm -hmm. But... It's called Forbidden Archaeology, Forbidden Archaeology, and that was the original edition. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it, you're right. It's about it's about four inches thick, <laughs> and there's a there's a two hundred. I'm not kidding. And there's like a two hundred page uh, version that doesn't have all the references. The it point the is storyline. Yeah, the point yeah. is that documented from all over the world from newspapers of the times, people were finding these giant skeletons and artifacts and iron nails in places in strata that indicated long before our current era there was conscious intelligent even technological life on earth that was the first clue that we're not the first and that the giants were merely a race that is maybe or maybe not memorialized you know in the uh, bible with david and goliath and the slingshot but that mm -hmm. all of the archaeological scientific evidence in North America, at least, of the existence, the real existence of this very tall, nine, 12 foot race of beings has been scoured up by the Smithsonian, locked away, and nobody ever says nothing about it anymore. That's like the Ring of Gyges. This was the story of Gyges. Mm. He's just a, an ancient farmer. Um, there's an earthquake, and then he goes out in the field after the earthquake, mm -hmm. and this cave has opened up, and he can see into this small cave, and there's these very large skeletons, and so he... In with, in with them, there there are artifacts with the skeletons. One of them is a ring, and there's some writing on it. You know, it makes me think of the the ring in the Lord of the Rings uh, right. trilogy. There, so, 
So anyway, yeah. he uses this ring. He, he puts it on and it makes him invisible. So he uses this ring to go into town and he ends up killing the king. I, I don't remember where this is. Um, I read about this long ago. And um, yeah, he ends up <clears throat> using the ring to kill the king and then he takes uh, the, the wife. He has this beautiful queen and he becomes the king. And it was because of this ring with this ancient technology that he has no idea how it works, just that it does work. Well, and, you uh, all remember Arthur's famous line, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And when Georgia joined us uh, at the top of the hour, she's going to be talking about real magic, i.e. real hyperdimensional technology, and it's going to be incredibly interesting. So, okay, this is all part of our folklore. The fact that we've got giant skeletons that keep being absconded and hidden away, that's not folklore, that's suppression. That's outright censorship of what? Of who we are, who we used to be, who we used to be friends with, or who we used to be enemies with, or of another extraterrestrial intervention in the nursery and another line, Ron, that was allowed to yeah. or made to die out. Oh, I think you're. I think this fits on your um, uh, shelf, uh, Richard, very well. Because the uh, yeah, this is something that was being implemented from external to our ecosystem here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How's that for generic? And uh, yet, you know, they had specific intent, specific goal, specific goals, and everything else, uh, which may have or may not have been. Uh, screwing up what was already there or tilting it in a particular direction. It seems to me if you're able to exercise great influence from the shadows, you're better off profiting from whatever is being produced in that situation rather than just trying to screw it up. Yeah, but, so it, I, but, but I suppose the goal is not to profit. The goal is to stop it, to kill it yeah. in the crib. Exterminators? Yes. Yeah, well, I... I think most of those aliens in the lovely robes that come down and visit the uh, visit so many people and and tell them of the wonders of the universe are mostly pretty racist. I think they think we're dogs. We're uh, because of our because of our tailored origins. Well, have you ever uh, read someone have you, else? Have you ever read the Billy Meyer notes in the original High German, which I was able uh, to have translated? In, from the 1970s, ah. from 75 on, you know. Who... I have read the Billy Meyer stuff, not in German though. Okay, yeah. well, this was the original. It was translated by a translator that I handpicked, so I know it's the best we've mm. got from him. Uh -huh. The Pleiadians turn out to be damn Nazis, absolute yeah, Nazis, exactly. pure and pure fascism, as evil and as crude and as malevolent as you can imagine of a black, you know, suited Nazi stormtrooper. And the uh, Nazis, have you yeah. heard of Franz Barden? Dimly. Refresh my memory, please. Well, he's a world famous occultist and he used magic. Magic is benign, you can use it for good or evil. He used it for good, but the Nazis, you know, captured him or whatever, they, they imprisoned him to try and force him to share his magic to help them win the war. Ah. And he went through these horrible tortures because he refused to share his magic with them. And then in 1945, um, his the prison he was in was bombed, and he and some other Russian prisoners were able to, uh, to escape, and the Nazis never got there. You know, they they wanted to know what that they wanted that black magic, and they were going to use it to win the war. Yeah, well, obviously. I mean, well, even, that was the Anne and Irby people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And on the other side, the uh, the Brits and Georgia will tell you in great detail were doing the same damn thing, except for the light side. You know, mm -hmm. the, you got the light and the dark side of the force. Where do you think, you know, um, uh, George got this idea? I think it's from our own history of not being alone.
And part of the suppression of the whole UFO, UAP, cunt, all of that is because those in power know the deal. They've made their deals and they don't want the game stopped. Well, can I throw out a metaphysical uh, note here? It's a very synchronous anecdote. I think you're, you'll get a kick out of Richard. Last fall, I go to bed. I'm lying there for just a minute or so, and I hear something come up onto my pillow, like the size of a spider, and it's making this horrendous, terrifying screech. What? That, yes. And I'm thinking, what in the heck could possibly make this sound? And it was, I was terrified. And I could feel it coming up on my pillow, like the way its legs. And all, I was thinking of Chekhov in The Wrath of Khan. It's right. going to go in my ear. Yeah. So it gets closer. It's coming. Because I'm going, is this really happening? <laughs> and so I jolt out of bed. I turn on the light. I look and I look. There's nothing there. And so... I walk around for a while. I, I was shaken. It was, I'm not kidding. It was terrifying. And I'm like, okay, now was I in my zone? Was I, you know, I'm in my zone or was I really asleep and it was some physical spider? Was it, right. do I have a tarantula in the house or right. what? And just by the weight of it, this they make was, any noise. this was huge. Yeah, it was a huge, like this was something, it was a huge spider. So this, this sounds like a psychic projection. Check this out. So I'm, I, I walk around for about 10, 15 minutes, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to go back to bed. You know, calm down, go back to bed. I, so I go back to bed. About a minute goes by. Holy crap, here it comes on the pillow again, and it's making this frightening, freakish, screeching sound I can't even describe. So on, it's like on. nothing is, earthly. Is the sound big, or is it tiny, like it's, a spider yelling its lungs up? Yeah, it's like a big T Rex, but now the T Rex is six inches tall and it's doing it. So oh, it is, okay. Okay. it's right. small, oh. but you can tell it's a ferocious. You know, and, and your imagination <laughs> does the rest. Okay. Yeah. So now it's coming from, and it's coming from my ear, and I and and I wait because I I want to know if this is real or if it's metaphysical, and I I can't even tell. And it comes up by my ear again. I jolt out of bed, hit the light, and I'm looking, there's nothing there. I'm like, holy crap. So the next couple of nights, I I slept on the couch. And then I got to the point where I'm like, <laughs> now I'm pissed. I'm like, all right, I've had enough. This is it. This thing has scared me out of bedroom. I'm coming for you. You mm-hmm. bring it. I'm coming for you. But So I go back to bed. There's no spider or anything. So then I go online. I'm looking for this spider thing. I come across this gentleman in... Ireland in the 1970s. He's a radio operator and he's doing this experiment to see if he can project over radio broadcast broadcast over radio waves music and and pure th- uh, thoughts of joy and everything to help def- de- uh, deflate the Irish um, all this friction and war that was going on in Ireland at the time. Right. So this this was this experiment and. He finds, uh, he gets this radio tower, and he gets it all set up, and one night he opens up um, some of the equipment, and he sees these black spiders in there, and they, they scurry around, and then they disappear into thin air, and he's going, what in the heck is this? So it was this whole thing, and <clears throat> that's exactly, now he's saying that they are te- metaphysical technology, and and they were actually like swimming in this black goo. He, his name is Miles Johnston. So he's talking about this black goo and these black spiders and how freakish and strange. So then uh, I was talking to Maria Wheatley just, uh, what's today? It was like two, two days ago. Mm-hmm. And, um, oh, I know what it was. She had gone to Stonehenge to take some video of her uh, with the rocks and the, and um, a friend of hers went with her to, to video her with, you know, she's putting her hand on the rock and this kind of thing. And so I'm telling her about this, the spider and how, how much it scared me. And then this experiment back in the 70s where this guy had all these spiders there, she goes, 
John, that's Miles Johnston. I'm like, yeah, yes, Miles Johnston. Yes. And she goes, the guy you hear talking in the background who's filming me, that's Miles Johnston. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. So Miles has a radio show. He's going to have me on his show, on, on a show, and I can't wait to ask him about these freaking spiders because that scared the crap out of me. Well, all right. Um, biblically, snakes are the bad guys. I've kind, yeah. of, kind of always wondered about that. How do spiders fit in terms of this? Uh, and I'm sure Georgia will have an answer. But how do spiders fit into this um, modality? They seem to be low level. I mean, it was terrifying, but they're low level when you compare them to Asmodeus, who is very powerful, Jen. But uh, these spiders are low level technology. They're, they're created with this metaphysical magic and then they are sent after someone. And what they do is they crawl. I felt like this thing was going for my ear, but uh, when you read about them online, you can look it up. They come up your shock, the spinal, yeah. you know, you have the chakras on the side. They come up and they, then they enter your head through a point right behind the left ear. And then they grab onto the C4, uh, C3 and C4 cervical uh, in your neck, because that's where all, you know, your nerve endings all come up and, and gather right there. And that's where they, they sit, they latch on, and they feed off your energy. They love it. Hmm. And you have to then mm. try to get rid of them. Yeah. And so you'll have people with problems like back problems or ear, people that can't hear out there, they get the ringing in the ear, all the, they say, this is from the spiders perched on your neck, the, sucking your energy. The giant screaming spiders. That's right. See, They're I'm wondering, giant, but given that small. ultimately the physics is all baked, baked back to mathematics, and the physics of between dimensions, eight, oh. remember, spiders have eight legs. If you're representing something in people's ken as a uh, meme, as a cultural carrier wave for the underlying message, Eight-sided geometry is the double cube octahedron of the ancient spacecraft we've been seeing all over the solar system that NASA just keeps rendezvousing with, okay? In other words, it's also the same figures that appeared in the middle of 2001 after um, uh, Bowman goes through the Stargate. Remember, there's a scene of glowing, slowly pulsating crystals, and they're cube octahedrons eight cube in other words the spider thingy may be physically representing the physics of intrusion and possession mm. yeah yeah I, I would agree with that mm -hmm. yeah god Ron, and you well, mentioned Ron, Ron has not found anything much wrong with what i've said tonight this is this is ab abnormal this is terrible I know. I actually, I actually credited you with something amazing. Uh, but the uh, here's a thought. Uh, probably most of the audience, certainly the crew here, is familiar with uh, that uh, old book, Flatland, by the mathematician, about someone who, yep. uh, a being in a two-dimensional space that was a, a, that encountered three dimensions. And yeah, I think the guy was named Which Abbott. Is, I think that was his name. That's it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, what he what would be seen in the uh, lower dimensional realm was a slice of the higher dimensional thing, you know, which could take almost any form. Ah, think about right, it. right. And so the, uh, yeah, the spiders might be a semi-metaphorical representation of the manifestation of something that was just kind of busting through. You weren't seeing the whole thing. You weren't seeing it in its own context or matrix. You were just seeing, you know, its effects. Uh, because there is some, I believe, there is some uh, amount of bleed over between dimensions uh, through that. I think clouds have, uh, are, have their origins in a dimensional bleed over 
but that's another story. Uh, Clouds are almost conscious. Spiders. Wait, wait, you mean when you're lying in your back and looking up in the sky and you see a bunny rabbit and you see Bridget Bardot and you see, in other words, that's mm-hmm. that's not just pareidolia, it's real something? Cloud cymatics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Actually, oh, that's that's yeah. not a that's not a very crazy idea at all. You know why? Richard, you said pareidolia. It's pareidolia. I'm going to grill people with that until people get it right. Go look it up. <laughs> Never pareidolia. Never what? Not one about, time in any dictionary. Can we talk about okay, this next when we come back? <laughs> we can talk about anything, <laughs> Please, John. But yes, the fact yes. that we have a nitpicker on the panel tonight. We have Ron George Ron with us tonight, and we've got Joan Womack, and in about half an hour, we're going to be joined by uh, Georgia Lambert. We cannot figure out what's happened to Dr. Bruce Solheim. Remember the uh, college professor, mainstream academic, who actually uh, is able to talk with his college about UFOs and with his students and ETs and all that, and is part of a study group looking at silent invasions. Isn't it weird that he was online just before the show and now we can't find him? You're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland. When we return, I'm going to tell you a horrifying story. But it happened because it happened to me. And welcome back, everyone, on this Sunday night. Almost Monday morning here in the land of enchantment. There's a gorgeous, well, there was a gorgeous. If you're west of us, you'll see it. If you're in Hawaii or in the Pacific or on an ocean liner, listening on satellite, there's a gorgeous crescent moon. A crescent moon, which is a target. A NASA spacecraft, a very large one, is about to lid to the moon, loaded with cameras, and will we finally finally get to see what is there which and i kid you not it could change everything and if it doesn't happen with nasa there are backups anyway back to my guest this morning now i promised you something kind of sensational and so i probably need to do a proper setup when it comes to metaphysics and uh the occult and religious uh, models. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm frankly that this is not my wheelhouse. Okay, so I've been backing into this by way of the uh, dimensional doorway, the idea that the geometry at Sidonia was a specific geometry. Stan Ten and I compared notes, and he says, "Well, I'm you know really collapsing this in a short period of time." Well, that just ain't. Any old geometry, that happens to be a geometry which is used and and laid out and published over and over again by people like Coxeter, who was a very high-level, hyperdimensional mathematician back in the 50s and 60s. Anyway, so I'm reading hyperdimensional mathematics and geometry and really getting lost, very lost, very lost, and suddenly, yes, oh my God, look at that. This is a geometry in mathematics memorialized in an ancient set of ruins on the planet Mars that embodies and embraces and celebrates something about human origins with a fused anthropoid looking facial representation, the face on Mars containing at least two species and maybe more artistically. And so I'm I'm working on all this and finally I get this big, big, big break I am invited by, of all places, a Buddhist, um, uh, what's the word I could look for? Study group, uh, enclave, um, you know, isolated and camp, whatever you want to call it, straddling the border between Utah and Nevada one night. And I'm flown out there, expenses paid, they put me up, they treat me wonderfully. I get to the place where we're going to do this first public Mars presentation of the data from Sidonia 
to a whole bunch of people that have never met me, don't know about me. They're just sitting there looking at data because the founder of the group wrote a book in which there were references to an ancient civilization on Mars. So when the invitation came in, when they heard of my work, I said, well, of course, I'll show up anywhere and talk about this stuff. You can imagine how I felt to have someone besides me to talk to about this after several years of research. Anyway, wind up there on the border between Utah and Nevada at night, and there's this incredible thunderstorm going on, lightning and wind, and, you know, you can't really do an outside presentation which is what I'd planned because there was no building big enough for the audience which had assembled to see what I was doing. So we had to kind of wait until the storm passed. Fortunately, uh, storms in the uh, uh, Rockies tend to be fierce but but quick. So there's this gorgeous post-sunset blossoming of wonderful weather and stars come out and a crescent moon just kind of like tonight and around the mountains there is lightning still flickering pulsing talking to each other and we're outside and i'm got all the projectors on the tailgate of this station wagon in case the rain comes back and we have to dash for it and i'm presenting for the first time to anybody outside a few people in berkeley the results of the first intensive investigation the possibility of extraterrestrial life at Sidonia. And I lay all this out and everybody is totally blown away. And we, you know, w- talked and drank our ways and discussed and partied well into the night, talking about the data and the implications and the uh, connections to, uh, you know, Buddhist tradition and gurus and ashrams and all of that. Okay. They put me to bed in the kind of, um, um, groundskeeper's cottage um, where where he and his daughters had left to go somewhere uh, in California and so the house was empty so they said okay you can use the spare room here and somebody was at the other end of the house I, I don't remember the details anyway I go to bed I'm on such a high because I've been sitting on this information literally for years this is the first public presentation and they seem to get it. And it seems to connect with the guru whose group this is, who invited me specifically to give this presentation. And so I'm, I'm really, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, a, you know, what, what, what are those metaphors you can think of? I'm, I'm happier than a pig in, well, whatever. Anyway, go to bed, go to sleep and wake up absolutely terrified to my core, to the core of my being, so paralyzed with fear and horror and terror that I'm literally screaming in this totally strange house in this totally strange bedroom so that everybody rushes in. There are two, three other people in the house, you know, absolutely thinking that I had somehow either been attacked or I was having some kind of, you know, incredible delirium, or in other words, something Olive was radically wrong. And the next day, all the way in the drive with these nice people who were taking me back to Berkeley, <clears throat> not flying but driving uh, through Nevada and Northern California and then down to Berkeley and all that, I proceeded to go over the details of this uh, nightmare does not begin to describe what I was subjected to by someone or something. And I'll tell you how I know. Because what I was, at the time that I was doing this presentation, we had a kind of a um, second track diplomatic effort going on through Esalen to try to get the Sidonia data, including the independent Mars investigation, uh, which had been still going on at SRI, to the Russians, to the Soviets, because the biggest thing that all of us agreed who were involved in this early study was if this really was taken seriously by the leaders of the world, we would kind of beat our swords into plowshares and try to stand together against 
whatever is out there and whatever unknown we're dealing with. In other words, it would give us perspective that the human race was a lot more related and a lot more dependent on each other than us versus aliens or E.T. or the unknown. So that was the kind of mode that I was in. And what this nightmare, which was obviously crafted specifically for my benefit, tried to show me in the form of audio and video, like in real time. It's like I'm in space, I'm in orbit, I'm looking at the Earth, and I'm watching nuclear fireballs, thermonuclear weapons going off all over the world. And it's World War III, which, by the way, what does Putin threaten every other day? World War III, the catastrophic elimination of Homo sapiens because of what I had discovered on Mars. That was the message. As I'm watching this, this reality show, the message in my deep brain was, you are responsible. You are responsible with all of the horrible guilt associated with being the person who is killing billions of humans. As I watch, all because, again, the refrain is, you kept going with this absurdity. You kept pursuing this nonsense. You, In other words, the refrain was, A, to terrify me to death, B, to make me so guilt-ridden that I would never, you know, pick up another pen, let alone a typewriter, and C, I'd never appear on any other media talking about what was really on Mars. And I woke up screaming, both terrified to my core. I have never, ever, even when I came out of a bar in Washington and three guys came up and they basically threatened to kill me unless I gave them my wallet, I've never been so terrified in my life. And simultaneously, I was incredibly, seethingly angry. And I knew why. Because I knew this was a fake. This was a big lie. This was an effort to get me to stop by pulling out all the stops and making me so afraid and so guilt-ridden that I would quit what I was trying to find out. And that was when I knew there were forces capable of trying to take over another human being. And for some reason, it did not work. Well, they like to do, they're they're easier to take over the weak minds. You you don't have a weak mind, Richard. So. I don't know whether it has anything to do with mind. I think it has to do with something else because I know a well, lot will, of very bright power, people. And the, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, I, yeah. I I think, and again, George is obviously going to have some thoughts to say about this in about fifteen minutes. I think it has to do with something at a much deeper. Oh, I'm going to hate myself in the morning for saying this. Soul level, having yeah, to that's do. That's what I mean. Having to do with missions, intent knowing the bad guys are out there. And this all triggered not only an incredible reaction, but a counter reaction that, no, this is what they do. They lie. Yes. Well, let's say, um, I'll rephrase it then. Uh, It's easier for them to sway younger, less mature souls. Now that's probably, see, I have a feeling I've been around before. Yeah. And but again there's no there's no measurement. You know, there's nothing where you can literally do a study and say, "Okay, these people are more amenable because they're such newborn babes. They have a clue what hits them when it hits them and takes them over." I am more of the opinion, and again, this is based on empirical, you know, research, that there has to be a wedge. There has to be some entry point. There has to be some weakness that they, you know, open, expand, push through. Exploit. Yes, that's the term. Thank you. Thank you. Am I wrong or right? No, you're absolutely right. I mean, you came... It was was close, believe me. It was close because I have never, ever been so freaking frightened to death. 
Literally, I can. I, I now know how people can be frightened to death. It was of that magnitude, but went along with it was not only the horror of personally I was going to die, but that I was responsible. The guilt, the guilt. And you obviously I have came a feeling, here. I have a feeling that they used the guilt trip because some part of me really doesn't want to kill a lot of people. <laughs> Well, yeah, you came here to enlighten people. And, well, let them off. Uh, I don't. I don't know whether I buy any of that. You, you had well, from my experience. You know, we come here and we have a mission in mind, and we uh, are given the opportunity to complete that mission. And um, you know, we're at school and so forth. So, yeah, you came here with this mission, and this went completely against that mission, and it, it horrified you. And I, I can. I could feel your terror just hearing you talk about it. But yeah, that's it's been, you something. It's been, it's been decades. And if I close my eyes, I can still see. And of course, now with Ukraine and Putin doing his stupid level best every day to scare people to death, I'm saying, is this what that was for? Was, this a for, was that a foreshadowing of where we are now and why it's happening now? Because something... We're on the brink of finding out, look at the whole congressional UAP UFO thing, that will unravel to the truth inevitably, but unless somebody pulls the trigger and there's nothing left to to understand the truth. Yeah, they they shut us down for 50 years going to the moon and so on, so we don't find out about any of that. Now we're going back and it's all coming, it's all starting to happen again, and the closer we get to it, the more chaos is is thrown at us see in 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 ron you're being very 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 quiet come on what do you think oh i just didn't want i just didn't want to step on that i was listening to that i think that uh your description of it uh that's classic information theory you uh if you want to manipulate people if you want to um make them uh bend to your will then you have to set up a credible scenario, even if it's a completely fabulous one, uh, and say, this is what's going to happen. And you convince people that this could happen. So you have all these incidents of people that have been abducted or contacted by who knows what, and they get these visions of exactly what you were describing, the earth blossoming in flames and uh, everybody dying. And it's always the same. It's a stale narrative. But, 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 wait, 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 wait. Those people are not made to feel yeah. they're responsible. They're watching it, but they're like observers. And the and the UFO, you know, and the and the uh, I'm trying to think of the guy in New York who wrote the book, um, interrupt not interrupted journey, um, missing time. Um, oh, the artist, yeah. artist. Yeah, but but that no, those people right. were you not were, made. Were those dialogue. people were not made to feel they were responsible if they just didn't do the one thing they were definitely going to try to do right well i know they dialed it back because for wider spread use uh you have to say well you can participate in this you can help be the solution you know all that kind of stuff that you hear in commercials all the time uh and uh, it's 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 the same basic pattern it's just that in the case of someone that was actually having some dramatic effect that was time sensitive like if you manage to get the manage to get the proper reaction right away at that point in time it would have much more we effect. were literally you know, yeah, de- we yeah, were they- literally dealing ron with the reagan white house simultaneously i wound up meeting uh roland sigdayev who was the head of the russian equivalent of nasa back then and i had a copy of the uh, independent mars investigation report from sri and as i'm mm-hmm. handing it to him I'm stand. I described this in monuments. I'm standing under this gorgeous dome at the National Academy of Sciences, literally handing our Sidonia research document from SRI to the head of the Russian space program, and he looks at it. He looks at me and he starts smiling. He says, "Oh, Mr. Hoagland, thank you. I already have a copy." <laughs> <laughs> so we succeeded. Yeah. We got through. Yes. Yes, but it's but the the fact that that same narrative of utter destruction, if things don't go the other direction, mm. whatever that might 
be in terms uh, keeps popping up again and again and again. And I, th- I think it's just a tool. I, it doesn't strike me as particularly um, astral. Or well, well, all right. Hang, I'm, 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 I'm very glad you went there because <clears throat> the first thing I thought of yeah. the next morning, and we talked about it for hours and hours and hours on the drive back to uh, uh, the Bay Area, could this sure. have been a technology? Could this have been, exactly. you know, MK Ultra, the CIA, the whatever the intel agencies are? They're they're a key part of 3D keeping us down on the farm. Could it have been a technology or? Was it something even more interesting? And the fact that this guru, the guy who'd invited me, literally we never met. I was his invited guest. I'm standing on his ranch presenting this incredible data, which corresponds to what he talked about from totally different sources in his own book. And he's driving around and around in his limo where I'm doing the presentation, never comes in, never introduces himself. I never meet him from the time I land to the time I left the next morning driving to the Bay Area. It's like I was, I was, I was persona non grata from whoever was behind him. And that got me thinking in a higher dimensional, and here we go again, spiritual realm, which says well, to me it, hyperdimensional physics. It's Absolutely. And in, Richard, in, uh, excuse me, Ron, I got to throw in an anecdote no, because please. Yeah, please. Um, no, please. after no, I please. hung up yeah. with you this afternoon, Richard, um, Russell calls me. Oh, and, yeah. He had sent me an email about this. I guess it's a new movie. This is, this called, is, this, uh, this is Russell Targ we're talking about, who I Russell really Targ. want to get on the show co-founder of SRI and uh, he had sent me an email about this it's called Aerial Phenomenon I believe it was and it's a a new movie about the kids I think it's in Africa and there's a bunch of kids that saw this alien and they all you know they drew pictures and all this kind of thing and oh Keith um, talked about it on the show the last couple of weeks right Keith yeah yes yeah Zimbabwe I think yeah 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 yeah. yeah. So a little bit of synchronicity there. Or, or, yeah. remember, synchronicity is just where you don't see most of the dots because <laughs> they're mm-hmm. being hidden. <laughs> okay. So let me, mm. let me, uh, we're, we're getting up to the top of the hour. Amazing how time is flying. I can't wait to hear George's reaction to, you know, what I've, I've never really talked about this publicly, certainly in this detail, because, mm. you know, you don't feel good when you're terrified to your tailbone. Really? You know, um, mm. A few years later, time intervenes, a whole bunch of other stuff, and, you know, Goddard invites me, NASA invites me to do the presentation, Uh, Keith's going to bring ABC News, they're diverted, all this political nonsense, you know, I wind up at NASA, um, uh, Lewis, um, the director there says, I'm the reason that George Bush decides to go back to Mars, all of this positive stuff, and then I get another one of these weird dreams. Except this time, there's no fear at all. The, the angle that something tried to show me would happen is that if I pursued this, I would be laughed out of town. I would never rescue any credibility I ever had, CBS, NASA, whatever. No one would take it seriously. I would die alone, poor, pauperless, and it was all a big damn joke, and I was a big sap. In other words total appeal to my ego and i also Mm. knew it was more manipulation so the (laughs) second exposure was a lot less intense but it had a totally different twist it was like me as an ego as an identity as a as a star would would go away because no one would believe the absurdities I was trying to lay out. And it was so funny, it was not even laughable. It was beyond laughable. You idiot, you poor sap, you poor... In other words, completely different approach. But I knew it was also a lie. Yeah, the fear did not work, so what's plan B? Well, this was the fear of not being whatever, famous or believed. Maybe it was a trial by fire. What does that mean? I look at 
Well, I look at this as intrusive telepathy. It's funny, yeah, you just yeah. mentioned Russell Targ, and I, mm-hmm. was, I was thinking Ingo Swan just a couple minutes mm-hmm. before that, because this is the kind of stuff remotely influencing people at a distance. And I don't think there's anything uh, necessarily extraterrestrial about that, unless that's a well, particular well, strain of wait, genes that wait, 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 up wait, some people. Wait, 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 Somebody wait. was trying to scare you. Are, yeah, but are we talking a human agent or extraterrestrial or hyperdimensional because to me they're all blended mm-hmm. together now you can't tell the players yes. that a scorecard and you can't trust the scorecard because they lie all the time yeah to keep us I in had a prison. Much milder I had a much milder encounter of, of that sort once which I, I don't have to supply any details I don't <laughs> think but I was someone who was connected with um, uh, things behind the curtain uh, and we were simply sitting, and I wanted to tell him something. Yeah. Uh, and I was being prevented from telling him what? Telling him that. Now you mess around in my head, I get really, really angry. Yeah. And I was uh, there. Was uh, I'm just sitting. We're sitting in public, and I'm having this battle going on in my head between uh, uh, this oppressive force. Do not say anything to him. Do not tell him. And it was. Uh, uh, the specifics don't even matter. It was just that it was a terrific overpressure, and the more that I tried to push it aside, the stronger a headache was uh, building in uh, in my head. And I finally gave up because it was not life or death at that point in time. But I was, uh, I was, you know, I felt like okay, I can battle this off. But you know, boy, I mean, if it had been crucial enough, I could have pushed it away. But it was, I could feel some sort of, like I said, a psychic overpressure uh, that was very specific because, you know, there was nothing about what we were talking about overtly that had anything to do with anything. And and I thought, hmm. So I believe that sort of stuff happens. And it sounds to me like somebody was testing you not necessarily to scare you away, maybe to te- maybe to a trial by fire to see is this you know if he gets this kind of scared, can he handle it? Will he stick with it? Hmm. So you know, I don't know. Well, it after that, when they when, after that when they physically tried to yeah. kill me in Florida twenty years ago, and Robin saved me, it was like there you go. It was almost like okay, this is interesting. Um, yeah. yeah. Been but, there, done that. But okay. see, what I'm, got? What I'm, else got? I'm, I mean, we're coming up to three minutes at the top of the hour, and then uh, George is going to join us, and she'll tell me why I'm wrong about a bunch of this stuff. But anyway, um, no, she won't do that. Um, to me, it got me thinking about this plane, three dimensions versus higher dimensions. And I got to wondering, which of course is very bad, what if... See, from I'm going to interrupt myself. For, for all the time that I've kind of looked at this stuff, touching on it over the years as I was growing up and reading Genesis and saying this this sounds more like, you know, uh, habitation of another planet by colonists as opposed to being stranded in a garden by God. That kind of I think I was six when I kind of wondered that, that out loud one, one afternoon to my grandparents. I've, I've looked outside the box. I've always been thinking outside the box. And we've always been told by spiritual types and whatever, and religious types, you know, this is just, you know, nothing but foreplay. The real action is off stage, after you die, before you're born. It, it's always, you know, it's like jam yesterday, jam tomorrow, but never jam today, and today is here. Here is not important. From my perspective, as I'm delving into this, I'm beginning to wonder if the real center where the war is being fought and must be won is in fact here in three dimensions and this is why all these battles are going on my guest this morning to be added shortly with one more uh john womack ron gerbron and georgia lambert will appear magically in a couple of minutes we're grappling now with the idea and we're about to open another doorway to another set of dimensions Is what goes on here actually of supreme importance to what goes on other places up the line? In other words, is this the first line of spiritual defense 
in favor of humanity, in favor of progress, in favor of consciousness, in favor of life. You're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland. We shall return. And welcome back, everyone. It is now the witching hour. I wonder why they call midnight the witching hour. Well, I don't know, but I know who we can ask. We're being joined right now, I believe, if I switch to the right screen. we got all these metonymic things. We're being joined by Georgia Lambert. Georgia, welcome back to the other side of midnight. Where would you like to jump in? <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Good evening. You, this, uh, by the way, nobody has mentioned it, but today is Pentecost. Oh, no, you're right. No one has mentioned it. Mm. Um, this, of course, is the day where the Holy Spirit or the fire of God descended upon the disciples and gave them power to go out and teach the world. And they have these little tongues of flame, right? Yes, right in their crown chakras or head centers, if you look at all the old paintings. Which has now been represented in the Catholic tradition as the Holy Ghost. That's right. Hmm, ghosts, so, other dimensions. Wow, what a concept. So it's, it's kind of a minor festival between the solstice and, you know. Hmm. I wonder what geometrically today, you know, because again, Back to the physics, it's, it's probably because of an angle or a resonance. Or, anyway, so start at the beginning. Where do you want to take us and what do you want to teach us that needs to be taught so we understand what we're trying to understand? Okay. Well, we know that magic is just really undiscovered science, right? Right. It's just science that hasn't been discovered yet. And... Uh, a lot of magic has to do with creating effects here in 3D by the manipulation of the more subtle realms or the impression on the force will cause activity here. You know, you were, you were saying right before the break that, um, uh, that you think that this is the real battlefield. I would, ag I would agree with that for a whole lot of reasons. What I'd like to do tonight oh, wow. is... <laughs> Yeah, what I'd like to do tonight is give the listeners an idea of the kinds of magic that we're dealing with. Okay. Hum humanity is um, creative. It's what we are as a species in relationship to the planet. And every level of our consciousness is creative, but every level is different. It's sort of like a different radio station, and things work a little bit differently at different levels. The two types of magic that we see referred to in terms of the activity of the bad guys are levels of magic that deal with the lowest two chakras, the one at the base of the tail, and the one that is related to the sacral center. And I'd like to explain what those are so that we know what to look for and we have some idea of why these work, even though no worker in the light would ever use these levels of magic. They are being used by the Black Lodge, you know, or the bad guys or whatever you want to call them. Mm. Uh, followers of the left-hand path, there's all kinds of nomenclature that relates to that. The first uh, kind of magic is the oldest kind of magic, and it's really part of humanity's very, very primitive and unconscious past, and that relates to the center at the base of the tail. Now, these centers, called in the East chakras, are like organs of the energy body that underlies the physical. That's the best way to think about them. But they're not just energy organs, they're also states of consciousness. 
the state of consciousness that relates to the center at the base of the tail has to do with the will to be in form. Now, the one up from that, the sacral center, deals with how we get to be in form. But the one at the base of the tail is the will to be in physical dense at all. And the kind of magic that is associated with this is death magic. Oh. And, I'd like to, and I'd like to explain what that is. Because when you talk about rituals or sacrifice, you're talking about death magic. So we need to see what that actually looks like. The way death magic works, first of all, imagine humanity in its infancy when the veil between worlds was thinner and humanity was a lot more psychic, naturally psychic, than it is today. Uh, Being dead wasn't being all that gone. Uh, The roots of ancestor worship go back because your ancestors just dropped their physical bodies, but they were kind of still around. And a lot of people could see them. The way death magic works was, uh, and and in Britain we still have vestiges of of this, where a member of the tribe, let's say, was uh, honored, and it was an honor in those days, it was voluntary, became the focus of the tribe. This is the old corn king approach, where a member of the tribe was chosen, and for a particular period of time, uh, months, weeks, uh, sometimes years, uh, this person was treated like uh, royalty. And all of the hopes and prayers and focus of the tribe was focused on this one individual. Oh, dear. Now, the thing is, when when sudden death occurs, a, a slow death, no, but sudden or violent death is a is an immediate propelling of energy from one level or subplane to another. And metaphysical tradition says that it appears as explosions of light on the astral plane or uh, one plane up from this. So you can imagine the kind of stuff that goes on during war or natural disasters when you have great numbers exiting all at once you want to hear something really really weird apropos of that sure the night my friend arthur c clark died was the night that nasa recorded on satellites the largest gamma ray burst ever seen oh how cute ever seen and of course i'm thinking of course arthur hi how's it going So, so the way that this works is the corn king would be the recipient for a set number of cycles, weeks, months, whatever. And he would be the recipient of the hopes and dreams and focus of everyone in the tribe. Then when he was ritually sacrificed, he, as the repository for all this focus, because thoughts are things, you know the old saying, energy follows thought. Mm-hmm. So when he was ritually killed, there was enough oomph uh, psychically to affect the force to bring the reins or the buffalo or whatever happened, uh, whatever the tribe was focusing on. And so death magic was a kind of magic that in a very primitive way worked. But it's something that should have been left behind uh, in humanity's past. So I was going to say, hang on, hang on. I'm, I'm going to be interrupted here. How do we know it worked? Because we're only all we have is anecdotal information, and we know how horrible we are at remembering specifics and details, and you know, from wish fulfillment to real thing. In other words, suppose it was the hind leg of the dog, meaning that that model really doesn't do anything, but they're, they were stuck with it because of something else that they no longer had access to that gave them a warped view of how this works. Well, I think that that's true, but what I'm talking about is a time before that, and then it didn't work so well. However, um, you know, there was a lot of dark, esoteric, occult stuff going on in World War II. You think? And, and a lot of people believe that 
uh, the killing of masses of people by the Nazis was not just to get rid of unwanted people, it was also an attempt at death magic at an unbelievable scale. Hmm. Uh, another thing uh, to win the war, to like to, like to like take nine power. like nine eleven. Yeah. Remember, or any, remember any of all those, those things. Remember all those images of the clouds of smoke before the towers right? collapsed, and, and there the are devil face and there the are literal daimon and you're going to explain them between demon and daimon images yeah. of facial really horrible faces that frankly look a little familiar from my research and i'm wondering if that literally was not an exercise in ritual hyperdimensional magic against what was perceived by some to be coming i think that's true and uh, isn't it interesting that Hitler's suicide, if that's what it was, or a substitution, because part of the old corn king tradition is the king can choose a substitute. Mm. Uh, oh, and, a designated uh, hitter. <laughs> uh, yes. And so a lot of people believe that um, Hitler's suicide, if that's what it was, oh, nice. was n it was on Beltane Eve, which in Germany was Walpurgisnacht, which is the night where the witches go to the top of the mountain for their sabbat. Well, that which makes is sense. Very time. If you if you're yeah. leading a a mass cult hyperdimensional movement, make your death yeah. mean something. If there really is a way to make, in other words, this really fits together. Uh, as a last resort, death magic at its ultimate. Hmm. Yeah, that's for sure. Hmm. So, so uh, it's interesting that uh, human sacrifice and animal sacrifice uh, has been with us until fairly recent times. You know, when when Jesus walked the earth, they were still sacrificing goats and doves and and all kinds of animals and. You know, Jesus talked about he came to fulfill the law and, and to bring old laws to a close. And death magic was supposed to have been brought to a close then, but it wasn't. And obviously, individuals and groups still are playing with it today. Well, let me give you a really horrible example that I've been thinking seriously about for the last, ever since we kind of wanted to do this show. How many people worldwide have we lost to COVID? I know. 15, 20 million? Suppose I know. Suppose that was part of this ritual because now is the time when these forces are trying to intervene because something huge is going to happen and we are given a choice, the right or the wrong decision but somebody's trying to wake the scales. I think that's true. The Pardon only me to butt in here, but the bubonic plague, and when you read about the jinn, people say that they use these plagues to, to wipe out masses of humanity. The only thing that, that, uh, that, that goes against that would be that uh, death magic needs to be sudden and violent. Uh, and death by uh, why disease. why why because it's a propelling uh, it's an immediate release of energy by the way a rush of fear will do the same thing and if we're talking about forces that feed off sensation it doesn't matter whether that sensation is positive or negative it's the intensity of the sensation that uh, is sought after okay the other kind of magic, and a lot of black magicians combine these two, the next, which is one chakra or center up from that, uh, is the sacral center, uh, which is sex magic. And the way that that works is obviously there's a particular kind of energy that's released during sexual activity. For those that know what they're doing, that can be directed. Um, for instance, is this the know, same Kundalini? No, it's 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 not Kundalini. That's oh. a whole nother, That's a whole nother thing. I'm glad a lot I of asked. people, <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of people confuse Kundalini energy with sexual energy. They're not the same thing. There is a relationship, 
because of where humanity is evolutionary-wise, but they're not really the same thing. Um, so the way sex magic works is, uh, for instance, if you fantasize about someone, um, that energy goes to them. When that energy is released, it goes to them. Think about the sex symbols in Hollywood, like Marilyn Monroe, where you've got thousands of people fantasizing about her, mm. picturing her during the sex act. And if the integrity of the personality isn't real strong, they can succumb to that. They can be you know, broken down by that kind of attention. Well, when I had the heart attack 20 years ago and Art saved my life with his very public consciousness experiment. Right, and right, I, I remember I, that. I literally felt that energy. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be, you know, Sophia Loren or Mar Marilyn I Monroe know. or whatever? The directed energy of all these leering, lustful, I mean, exactly. how, how does anyone survive that? Well, you have to have a very integrated, strong persona. Um, you know, this is this is the meaning behind the biblical thing, lusting in your heart that <laughs> Carter oh, got Jimmy in trouble Carter, from. Oh, Jimmy Carter, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but the but um, the the thing with with uh, sex magic, going back to Hitler, do you know that there were pamphlets uh, uh, distributed to the SS officers that marked maps of graveyards and which graves to go to to copulate on so that you could bring back spirits of departed German heroes. Oh, my. Yeah, isn't that lovely? Oh, um, well, was it real or was it just branding? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, you know, um, the, the point is that... Um, the, the, the way that that kind of energy can be controlled by those that know what to do with it is by one of two ways, either suppression or splatter. And let me explain that. Remember Reverend Moon? Yeah, sure. Heavenly deception. Oh, boy. Let me tell you. Um, he insisted on celibacy for his flock until they married, he chose the mate for them, which they didn't even meet until the altar. Right. And then they were told that when they copulated, to only think of Reverend Moon. Oh boy. <clears throat> so look at the look at the dynamic of that. You've got the suppression of the sacral center in a mass population, and then when it's allowed to uh, be active, it's purposely directed. Um, religions throughout history have tried to control the sacral center of populations, either by making it, quote, sacred or uh, enforced or whatever. If you think about that, um, when you look at um, medieval monasteries, where they took, first of all, people in monasteries at that time were there not because of a spiritual calling so much as they were second sons that couldn't inherit land, and that was the only place you could get an education if you were smart. Hmm. So people took vows of celibacy and vows of silence. Now, there's a too long to go into, but there's a polarity between the sacral center and the throat center, which is the creative center, procreation and the sacral center creativity in the throat center so you shut both of those down that energy's got to go someplace mm. and now and now you've got that backed up energy causing sadomasochistic activity like the inquisition the monks that stayed the, the healthiest psychologically were the benedictines who did take vows of celibacy and silence but they also were creative they made beer they made stained glass windows they did illuminated manuscripts mm. so that creative energy had some place to go the by the way, way if, if, if everybody wants to see this in graphical form i love pictures i'm a visual guy georgia has one major item tonight the seven centers item number one just click on georgia's name under the banner on the guest page it will take you directly to her item i believe um, okay, yeah, it's, uh, yep, there it is with the... Uh... Yeah, it's there. Don't so, you find it so, interesting that it's seven? 
Well, there are actually more than seven, but all of the books show seven major ones. And and Jonathan t- typed a comment. Alistair Crowley comes to mind. Yes, yes. Not only, not only Alistair Crowley. He now now he did sacral magic in the other direction, as did Charles Manson, which is not suppression, but splatter. In other words, group orgies, and. Uh, trying to get everybody to climax at the same time and then the leader can manipulate and shape that particular energy and and that's my item number nine that's this is where crowley when he was in england he went into this dolmen here and would do his black magic and and in a lot of this oh my look at that in, in a lot of this dark stuff you see sex magic and death magic combined in really horrible ways but it's important to know that that this kind of directed energy um, can affect the force and it's it's not something any worker in light would do and I always tell people you know as far as your fantasy life if you wouldn't do something physically don't do it in your imagination Mm because in your imagination you are still doing it you are still directing well, see, that's why this, this global suppression for thousands of years of this stuff really isn't real. I think it's very important because if, if you want the real power reserved only to the in crowd and everybody else is just kind of following the numbers, you don't want to let people know this stuff is real technology. Be exactly. careful. Exactly. Now, there there is a level of magic for all of the chakras, but the ones that you know, are relevant to our discussion tonight are these lower two. Um, again, in in humanity's early development, as humanity was developing the chakra system, the center system, this kind of manipulation um, was, you know, right and true for that particular time. But it no longer is and hasn't been for a very, very, very long time. Um we see whispers of it, vestiges of it in things like tantric magic. And, you know, back in the 60s when sex was still safe, <laughs> um, people people were, you know, all into tantric magic. They had no idea what tantric magic really is. Uh, if they really knew, they would be horrified. Uh, real tantric magic, first of all, you have to be, the couple, each of them has to be in lotus posture. Figure that one out. Uh, and this is usually done in a charnel house on a mound of dead bodies. And oh, that sounds so cool! Doesn't doesn't that sound fun? <laughs> and the the way the energy is sounds directed, like Wednesdays. <laughs> <laughs> the way the energy is directed is that at the moment of simultaneous climax, which is uh, engineered that the energy is then forced up into the head and uh, uh, you know the the little thing under your tongue that that, um, holds your tongue to the the bottom Mm -hmm. of your mouth? Mm -hmm. Tantric practitioners would, would cut that so the tongue could be folded back into the throat and the underside of the tongue where there are sensitive uh, nerve currents, which is why you take uh, homeopathic medication under your tongue, mm-hmm. uh, that area under your tongue would engage the uvula, which has another energy power supply. That connection would be made with that uh, sexual energy coming up, and it would be uh, forced into the head to do God knows what. But This uh, sounds a bit like the old Mark Twain story. <clears throat> when he was offered to be uh, uh, ridden out of town on a rail after being tarred and feathered, and he said, well, if it weren't for the honor of the thing, I think I'll just pass it up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this does not sound, who in the, why the bodies? What do the bodies, dead matter, do uh, to no. the physics? It was all symbolic. I, I was mean, gonna say, is, it's, gotta be, Hindu- it's, it's gotta be the collapse of so many memes into where exactly. it, it's basically just a whatever kind of stuck on the wall. Exactly. The point is, with these two types of magic, whether it's death magic or sex magic, either by suppression or splatter directed, 
kids, don't do this at home. This is this no. is not this uh, is not Georgia? something the the worker in the light would do. Yes. Yeah, I just I hate to slow a roll. I just uh, <clears throat> but one tiny comment. Uh, you said, uh, well, everybody said, if you uh, if you don't do it in the real world, don't do it in your head because it has the same effect and so forth. Uh, are you familiar with Dover books, those big paper bound things that have reproductions of oh, old yeah, engravings yeah. and stuff? Yeah. Okay, uh, and there are several of those that have medieval illustrations. You know, like the embe- like mm-hmm. the embellishments and elaborations that they would do on manuscript pages, right? Uh, and when and they're reduced, what do they call that? Line- not not embossing, not engraving. What's the? What's the technical term for that? Anyway, there's etchings, there's woodcuts, illuminating, illuminated manuscripts. Illuminated, oh, that's the word. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. That he said, well, if you reduce those to black and white uh, line drawings, which is what those. Uh, the Dover books give you. Uh, I, I submit to anyone out there, go grab a couple of those and look carefully at those medieval illuminations that were surrounding the letters on the pages about the Holy Scriptures and everything else. Right. They are all full of sexual re- sexual pictures. Oh, my God. They're not God. even references. I mean, we're talking body parts. We're talking body parts down to every detail you can imagine. Like the freezes in Sri Lanka. Yes, yes, yes. It's every bit as exotic as anything in the Elephanta Caves or the uh, uh, stuff in Sri Lanka. It's, uh, I is, mean, it's. This is not a new thing. It, advertisers use it all the time. They airbrush things into ice cubes. There was a, 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 a there was a, a book uh, called Hidden Persuaders by Vance Packer mm-hmm. many many years ago. Yes, and he gave an example of a Howard Johnson's menu. That showed spaghetti until you looked really close, and it was an orgy scene in the spaghetti. Oh my designed, god! Well, see, I design, have a personal designed experience designed to affect I, designed to affect the subconscious. I have told this story once or twice before. When I was working with Cronkite, the artist, the head artist for the unit, took me downstairs to the set design group one day and showed me this gorgeous, beautiful globe. They were preparing to rotate grandly behind Walter as. We went to the moon and back and all that, and in the clouds, he had written his name, and you didn't see it until he told you, and then it was unmistakable. So for weeks, every time I watched you know, our coverage, there was Tom's damn name behind Cronkite, <laughs> rotating grandly in and out of view every few minutes. Well, you uh. know... It, it it does affect the subconscious. But back to our subject tonight, um, you see when, when you talk about sacrifice and ritual, you're talking about this sort of magic. And uh, again, it's, it's, uh, it's really dark, nasty stuff. But Whether what is it supposed to do? I disagree a little. I don't think sex magic is necessarily that bad. <laughs> depends on what it's used for. I mean, well, exactly, there's, exactly. There, there's, you know, there's, I... a, there's a higher there's a higher direction of this that has to do uh, too long to go into in a in a uh, venue like this. And thank but... goodness we're at the bottom of the hour. My guest this morning, <clears throat> Ron Gerbron. God, so okay. Um, Georgia Lambert and John Womack. Uh, Bruce Solheim is missing. I don't know where he is, what dimension he slipped into, but I swear he was there just as we were, you know, about to open the show. So maybe somebody did not want him to talk to us. Gosh. You're on the other side of midnight. The last half hour, we're going to try to tie some things together that you may not know, and some things you may have heard, but uh, they probably need to be heard again. You're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland. We shall return.
And welcome back, everyone, on this Sunday night, now Monday morning here in the Land of Enchantment. The moon, of course, has long since set, but our guests remain one last half hour. Georgia, let me pick up with this. Um, I have this feeling that now is a special time because of the cycles, the processional cycle, the various planetary cycles within that, and that, like, everything is coming down to the wire, and there's this kind of war, both metaphysical and physical, because the bleed-through is getting stronger and stronger, that people now have to make decisions, and a lot of them, for whatever reason, are making the wrong... Go ahead. I I completely agree with that. This is a time when humanity... at all different levels is making choices as to where we're going to go and how we're going to get there. Um, And if we have a presence among us, which really wants us to simply, remember that great line, Independence Day, what does he want us to do? We just want you to die. In other words, something is trying to insidiously kill this experiment, whatever it is. Or keep, keep us asleep. You know, there was something that was said before I came on that I I happened to listen. Um, And uh, Jonathan will know what I'm talking about here. Jonathan, you know the the Alice Bailey books. Yes. Um, There is, in one of the books, uh, he makes a statement that uh, evil on this planet has its origins in one of the Pleiades. What? Yeah. You mean around one of the stars in the in the Pleiades yeah. cluster? Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, wait, 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 wait. Remember what I said at the top of the show about Billy Meyer? Yeah, and, that's what I that's and, what and, I'm referring to. And in reading the Pleiadian notes, they're absolute pure black-hearted Nazis. Well, see, there you go. And I think they're family. I think they're related somehow to this yeah, larger thing I keep talking about. There's there's a, a polarity between the seven stars of the Great Bear, which are considered masculine, right. and the seven sisters of the Pleiades, which are considered feminine. And the star Sirius is the balance point between these two. And oh. that there is an imbalance that needs to be righted. And one of the stars they don't say which one but one of the stars of the pleiades is the one where the the difficulty here is coming from or at least a good portion of it do you remember its name it didn't give a name just said one of the stars oh well there's alcyon uh i don't remember them all offhand but they're all known they all have names are all attached to yeah i I believe it's the greek muses i think is that Scientology, too? Is that where they're from? No. No, no. Oh, okay. Yeah, the Seven Sisters is kind of a metaphor for the constellation because there's yeah. really, if the air is clear enough, you can uh, you can see up to 21 stars in that area. There's a whole bunch of them. So why right. was the number seven picked? Because it's the physics. Again Probably. and again and again. That's why I asked about the seven centers. I don't think that's accidental. No, it isn't. Uh, in in metaphysical tradition, it's it's all septenary stuff. The the particular energies that make up the building blocks of the universe are called the seven rays, or in Hinduism, the seven rishis. And so you see this seven repeated over and over and over again on all kinds of different levels. Wow! By the way, the Artemis. Incredible SLS rocket, biggest since Saturn V, is slowly making its way from the vehicle assembly building to the pad 39B, 39B, one half of 19.5. It gets better. Continue, please. Well, it, the timing is perfect because today is Pentecost, but Pentecost is a three-day festival, so the next two days are still within that Pentecost window. Now that's interesting. Gosh, you wouldn't suspect that NASA might be doing this because it's ritual? No. Do you think? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, uh, I tried this the other night, and I blew it because I didn't leave enough time. 
So at 38 minutes, uh, you know, to the hour, I'm going to do, try it again. I've been looking at these mass shootings for a very long time. And I've seen all the debates. I know up and down, back and forth. I can talk about the Second Amendment. I can talk about originalists. I can talk about, you know, the 1994 assault weapons. I can talk about it all. But what's interesting about this one, the one in Uvalde, is for the first time, and I've really looked, someone made sure, A, it happened, and B, that all the right numbers were connected to it to connect it directly to the hyperdimensional physics model. Now, I'll give you an example. I've said a couple of times tonight that seven is really important, and that's because of the seven symmetry spins of a four-sided tetrahedron in three dimensions. There are only seven ways to spin a tetrahedron symmetrically, and in physics, symmetry is everything. Why is a tetrahedron important? Because if you look at the solar system and you look at the mathematical models, in a rotating mass spinning, there will be a equilateral triangle four times tetrahedron embedded inside stars or planets that spin that have fluids and the physics demands that the energy so invoked from a higher dimension emerges on these planets and or stars, like huge mountains on Earth or on Mars, big giant red spots on Jupiter, or the peak latitude of sunspots, solar activity on the sun every 11 years, it all occurs at 19.5 degrees, which actually is 19.5 for seven degrees. So I'm looking at Evalde, and the first thing that said, whoa, this is weird, was that when the shooter was first pursued in the school, we were told there were seven cops that followed him in, tried to get into the classroom, were repulsed by him firing his AR-15 through the door, wounding a couple of them, and they beat a retreat. Then a few minutes later, we're told 19 cops entered that hallway. And for some bizarre, mysterious reason, determined by the tactical commander, um, a, a guy named Pete Alessandro, I believe, waited and waited and waited in that hall for over an hour. At 12.03... According to an official log now, the first call from inside the room from a little girl, a fourth grader, to the 9-11 operator said, please send help. These calls were repeated by numbers of students, some multiple times, some shot because they tried it many times over the next few minutes. At 12.50, against the orders of the guy in charge, the feds, the tactical team from the uh, Custom and, and Border Patrol, they stormed the room, killed the shooter, and rescue what's left of the bleeding out students. And they waited to do it exactly 47 minutes. 19 4 Seven, nineteen point four seven, the mathematical signature of a connection between this reality, three dimensions, and higher sets of dimensions whereby energy and consciousness can flow. And now we know, because of that incredibly brave mother who rushed into the school after being arrested and rescued her two kids, that there were not 19 cops in the halls. There was nobody. So the number 19 was chosen, quote, randomly to then be promulgated all over the world in endless newscasts. 1947, 1947, 19 cops waiting 47 minutes, 19 mythical cops to go rescue 19 victims at 47 minutes after they called for help. It was 
incontrovertibly a ritual and the mainstream press is just beginning to suspect that this is so much deeper and darker and weirder. And my question, I guess, to you, um, Georgia, did all these little kids, did they die so that the rest of us wake up? Gosh, well, I hope we wake up regardless of anything else that's going on. Um, you know, it's it's hard to say with these kinds of situations. Uh, we know that that nature is not random. There's always order and 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 mathematical purpose to everything. And when you see an incident like this, where uh, so many different things collide into one another. It's it's really hard to say whether it is consciously and maliciously directed, or once something is in motion, it's naturally going to find its own geometry. You know, it's hard to say which is which. I think we have a caller. Let's see who in our audience this morning either thinks we're nuts or actually has something to add. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to open or up both. I'm or both. Thanks a lot, Ron. See, Ron is playing yeah. his role. So, let me go to yeah. area code 978 and you are on the other side of midnight. What's up? Hello. Great show everybody. There you really are. really awesome stuff. Can can you hear me? We can hear you five by. Go ahead. Beautiful. Um yeah, no, you got it. Um this has just been a really, really incredible show. Um, I have uh, too many synchronicities, like pop culture ones to mention, so just feel free to cut me off whenever. But I have some notes. I'm just going to kind of rattle them off here real quick for you. Um, starting with kind of the beginning of that spider black goo conversation from uh, from like an, an hour and a half ago. Yeah. Um, are you guys <laughs> are you guys watching uh, Stranger Things by any chance right now? No. Or have you seen them? Well, you should. There's, there, I'm not going to give you spoilers so. away, but there's some... Uh, yeah, there's some. It's all about like the, the entire, uh, majority of the plot is remote viewing and trauma based or basically ritual trauma. Wait, wait. I think I, I think I missed the title. Of, I think I missed the title of the show. What's the say? It's slower. Say it's slower. <laughs> Str- stranger things. Oh, stranger things. Is that the one set out west somewhere? Montana. Uh, it's mm. in uh, Hawkins. In Indiana. Oh, okay. no, that, you're thinking of outer range. Ah, know. that's right. That's right. Um, thank you. Thank no, you. but yeah. Well, like, the, so it's all about um, people with the ability to remote view and like MK Ultra and Montauk Experiment type. Right. Quality. Where it's in Indiana? In the '80s, uh, Hawkins, which I'm not sure if it's a real okay. place or not, but it's just okay. it's small. It's small town Probably USA, not. basically, is, is the crux of it. That's where I'm from. And they they have like a. Oh really? Oh wow! Wow! Uh, wow! Think we're gonna be there. But uh, if you guys aren't aware of the show, this is going to absolutely blow your mind what I'm, what I'm about to say. So it's all about a, a, a girl, a young girl who's traumatized, um, who has these abilities to remote view, to access alternate realms, what they call the upside down, and they evoke different Dungeons and Dragons type lore. But it's open gates, to o- open portals to contact this, this other realm of entities, which the basically the big bad, like the, the overlord of this other side is... Um, called the Mind Flayer, and it looks like a giant spider, basically. And it's ah. trying to use trauma to, it's trying to, and like, there's a, a more direct spider correlation in the most recent season. I don't want to give any spoilers away, but the main character, the one with all the powers, her name is Eleven, which again, that's, I mean, that's four plus seven, and it's also a big Crowley number, nine eleven, eleven. 11, that whole, that whole deal. And uh, if you want to talk ritual, um, eight, sorry, I'm, I'm working, I'm on break, so I'm just going to kind of ramble, I know, I know I'm rambling bad, but I got some good stuff here. So for that timeline you were just talking about, Richard, the shooting, the one he entered the school, according to this timeline that they gave you or gave us, starts at 1133. So mm-hmm. again, the 11, again, obviously the, the 33, the, uh, the that torsion physics numbers there. Exactly. Um, but then as and then as well, the ritual aspect of it, this, this entire show is about these um, ultra terrestrial-esque entities, negative ones that are feeding on people in the 3d world through their trauma trying to use that trauma to bust into our reality from what they call the other side which is the void or whatever you want to say the other realm the other side now that's an interesting plot twist 
Hmm. And we and, we, and if you want to Google real quick, um, Stranger Things, Empire State Building, and oh. look at the news. Look at the uh, the news results over oh. the weekend. They they released their their um, third season. I mean, this is their fourth season. This is the this is the biggest show in the world right now. Really? And on 15, on fifteen different locations all around the world, the Empire State Building, this beach in Australia, the this gate, this um all major tourist attractions, major ritualistic locations. They projected what they call Stranger Things rifts or portals. Oh, and had tentacles and these mind flayers, these weird um, archon esque things that want to feed on us, it's like emerging out of that portal. Now, they this is this, 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 this is in the show, not really around the world, this is right? Real life. This is, this is, Google News. This. This would be ABC.com. This would be this would like a quick, quick Empire State Building. Stranger thing. You you lost me. And is this in the result. plot or is it going on for real? It's real. real I'm looking oh, at okay, it see now. that's what I need to know. This is Be- real life. Oh. Because yeah. so, I was just looking at some imagery from the Queen's Platinum Jubilee and the beacon oh, yeah. she lit and the bunch of other stuff really had a quote hyperdimensional slash occult feel and the beacon thing was all it looked like DNA. Spiraling out yeah, across no, England, and she she had used. Um, they also like speaking of projection, they projected her image on every stone on Stonehenge over the weekend for the Platinum Jubilee. So, oh, I hope Maria I mean, got some images of that. That's a real yeah. You guys, shut up, Maria too. She's and great. do you know that um, when, when they did the procession in the carriage that she did back in fifty two today, she was not strong enough to sit in the carriage apparently. But they put a hologram somehow in the carriage to represent her from decades and decades ago. If this isn't all a, a higher dimensional ritual, Georgia, uh, I am not uh, whatever I am tonight. <laughs> and Maria's been partying hard, so yeah. I don't know if she... <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, Derek, uh, I'm, I'm going to say goodnight because I want to get to uh, another listener in... Uh, in Manhattan, who I think has something important, and we don't have, we got about ten minutes left. Okay, so thank you so thank much. You. Uh, great show. Yeah. We we that will do cool. more really of this. Awesome. Thank you. Definitely, definitely. Thank you, sir. Okay, area code two one two. You are on the air. Hello, area two one two. Go. Oh, he's just listening. Darn, darn. Okay. Oh, that's so embarrassing. I know, I know. I, I, I should learn how to read fine print. George, you were going to say something. Uh, no, I wasn't. Oh, okay. That's surprising. <laughs> oh, well, Ron will always want to say something. <sighs> you know, the, the spiders thing is really interesting. I mean, you, you look at, you know, uh, uh, like the spiders in Harry Potter or Shiloh being mm-hmm. Lord of the Rings and and um, uh, it, it, the spider is an important symbol not because it's a spider but because of the web that it makes and the web is ah. symbol, the, the web is symbolic the ensnaring of the, the, well it's symbolic of the etheric network that connects everything to everything else or is it trapping and, of prey well, one little little movement on the web, the whole web reacts to it. And so, you know, this mm-hmm. this etheric network that connects all worlds and all dimensions, when something happens on one level, it has echoes on others. Well, you they know, don't call it the World Wide Web for nothing, also. That's true. That's yeah. very true. John, you're being very quiet. Well, I was just thinking about uh, Derek because he lives in, he works at the Star Market. Oh. Across from where I used to work in Somerville. Oh, you're fellow so, Bostonites. Yeah, hmm. so it's a little bit of synchronicity. Hmm. Yeah, Derek's called in before. He's always got good stuff. So keep him coming, yeah. Derek. Okay, guys, we got seven minutes till the end of the show. I didn't believe I said that. <laughs> Seven tetrahedral minutes. Well, how do we want to use them? How, where should we leave people, Georgia? Because to me, what was so the most frightening of all 
I had no training, no background, no education, no preparation, and I'm stuck out there naked in front of something that's trying to take over my soul and turn me into a shoemaker, and I had no defenses, none. How do we give people defenses? Well, the first thing is the, they have to be a well-integrated persona, strong within themselves. Again, you look at the example of uh, people that become famous that can't handle it because of all the attention, positive and negative. I mean, look at the president. Wasn't there a book years ago about how a president ages in office? Mm-hmm. Because they become sort of the recipient of all of that attention for good or ill. And unless they're very strong within themselves, um, they have open doors that, you know, uh, stuff can can enter. And that's really the thing, that things can't enter unless you open a door. But none of us are masters yet, so we all have lines of least resistance. We all have areas of, of weakness when we fall into an anger or a depression. Uh, a part of our aura thickens and it, it lets greater stuff in now i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna worse. i'm gonna raise an idea that i'm again doing this show is a very unique this is not what i signed up to do okay but i've got the show i have this exquisite audience i've got obviously people listen i know that from a whole bunch of stuff let me lay something out i am looking at the possibility that after they failed twice their third try was taking robin and there is awful evidence to support that, which means they're not done. And it's been incredibly hard to continue to do what I'm supposed to be doing over the last three years. Well, well, that could be, Richard. I mean, you, you it know, makes this, no sense this, otherwise. This, There's this no reason why Robin shouldn't be here. None. This, Zero. This, this resistance is on all levels. It's it's on the unconscious human level of people just don't want to change and 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 fear of the unknown in the future, all the way up to those in other planes and dimensions. That, but see, the, this almost seems to be a sadistic revenge. We're gonna get you, and this is how we're doing it, and it's the most agonizing. You know, I mean, any and any mother, the, the mother was rescuing her kids. She wasn't thinking about her own her, her safety or whatever. She was thinking about them, them. Richard, yeah. All of this sounds somewhat like an extension of that chaos that was previously mentioned. I mean, there's uh, <clears throat> other there's other other examples of it. I mean, I find the fact that there have been a whole basketful of multiple shootings from kids basically in the last week or so yeah yeah and it was like it was like they send uh something sends out a trigger signal and it it activates various well there there there, 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 more there, than others. there are two ways to look at that one is copycatting because when you place yeah, i don't think that's it when you i don't either because it seems much more resonant with this model that something mm -hmm. is escalating the curve trying to create chaos and horrible trauma at so many levels because remember the other night I said if you wanted and I'm talking about this not just planetarily but multidimensionally if you want to take over a place destroying it with weaponry is secondary to in, insinuating within to where it breaks down from within and you walk in unopposed and that appears right. to me to be what's going on so much chaos thrown at so many people who had no defenses Yeah. Random, well, it's random the most, and... it yields the most energy for them when you kill innocent kids. I mean, that fear is the purest, sweet. It's like can't you yeah, know? Yeah. See, again, these really... are these are ideas. I don't know that. I, I have a feeling it's much more strategic, and I think it's part of a larger war, maybe in higher dimensions. I mean, you know, when you read Revelation, it sure does almost read like it's at the wrong end of the of the uh, of the bible it should be how we got into this place not what's going to happen up ahead 
So they're not events that are detailed so much as memes. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. And I yeah, could be I, wrong. I, Your I, mileage I, may vary. Hey, guys, would you realize that we're all out of time? It's literally the last 30 seconds. I want to thank my guest this morning. Um, 90 John, seconds. And I'm going to turn that down. Thank you. Um, Ron Gerbron and Jonathan Womack. And, of course, Georgia Lambert, our resident metaphysician. Did I remind everyone that she was with uh, Manly Hall, E. Manly Hall, for like 10 years plus? Anyway, next week, we're going to go back to physics with an extraordinary new ancient archaeology find on Saturday. And Sunday, I may have a major surprise. We will find out. So until then, again, I want to thank everyone for an amazing conversation. And obviously, this is not the end. This is but the beginning. Pay attention very closely because things that are happening in the mainstream, I think, are being triggered by the non-mainstream. Let's, let's leave it like that. So until next week, same time, same bat channel, remember, third star on the left, straight on till morning. Good night, everyone. <laughs>